earn you know, maybe some um, stipend or whatever. Um, yes, I would like to talk about a work today that I produced in 2019. Um, I have been invited to show in a small space, very small space, where is the, ah, here, yeah. um, in Berlin, on Leipziger Straße, in a building that is directly connected, it's basically the next entrance, um, to the Julia Stoschek con collection in Berlin. I don't know if any of you uh, have been there before or saw it, she has a huge um, art space there where she shows her collection and works that she likes or collects. And I will show you just in how small this room actually, this space actually was. This, these are two installation views. So the work is called Jerry Cans to Can Jerry. Jerry cans are the, the canisters that you see there. They are called jerry cans. They are named after, the, uh, their name comes from the term that the British gave the Germans, namely the jerrys. And um, so this implies that this jerry can is a German product. In German it's called um, um, Wehrmacht Einheitskanister. I think, something like this, a difficult name. Um, yeah, so, this jerry can has been produced by a German company um, called um, Max Brose Fahrzeugteile GmbH. And they have been produced for the Wehrmacht, for the German army, and um, with the help of uh, forced labor um, or slave labor, basically. Um, um, so the company asked for um, workers and they received um, about 200 prisoners of war that had to help produce um, this canister. And about this, I made a film, and I will show you the film, and then I will tell you what this is all about, and why I showed it there, and so on. So, let's see how this works. Wisst ihr, warum wir hier sitzen? Weil Jerry den Krieg verloren hat. Ich war mittendrin und habe alles gesehen. Jerry. So haben die Briten die Deutschen im Zweiten Weltkrieg genannt. Ich bin eigentlich auch aus Deutschland, aus Coburg, der ersten Nazistadt Deutschlands. Meinen Namen, Jerry Kahn, habe ich also von den Briten bekommen, weil ich ein deutsches Produkt bin. Später wurde ich selbst zum Briten und mein Name bekam noch eine ganz andere Bedeutung. Aber davon erzähle ich euch später. Erstmal erzähle ich euch, wie die ganze Geschichte begann. Deshalb seid ihr ja hier. Ich habe es schon sehr oft erzählt und ich werde sie euch heute noch einmal erzählen. Aber diesmal könntet ihr endlich mal richtig zuhören. Ich bin wie ihr und ihr seid wie ich. Und solange wie es euch gibt, soll es auch meine Geschichte geben. Ihr müsst aber verstehen, warum. Und deshalb müsst ihr zuallererst verstehen, wo ihr herkommt. Im Internet gibt es Videos von irgendwelchen Typen. Prepper, die sitzen in ihren Wohnzimmern und erzählen, wie sie sich auf die Apokalypse vorbereiten. Die reden ständig von uns und stapeln uns haufenweise bis unter ihre Kellerdecken. Wie soll man diesen Schwachsinn verstehen? Well, in Jerryland nichts Neues, wenn man nur die verdammte Geschichte kennt. Die Deutschen haben es mit den totalen Kriegen. Nach dem Ersten Weltkrieg kam gleich der Zweite. Wieder war es der deutschnationale Imperialismus, der den deutschen Erfindergeist so richtig auf Hochtouren brachte. Für Expansion braucht man Mobilität. Für Mobilität braucht man Treibstoff. Und für den Treibstoff brauchten sie mich. Deutsche Ingenieure haben mich 1936 entwickelt. Sie haben mir ein großes X 
in die Brust gestanzt, für mehr Standhaftigkeit. Meine Schweißnaht ist wie eine Vene durch meinen eigenen Körper vor Verletzungen geschützt. Mein Verschluss hält höchsten Druckstand und durch meinen etwas schiefen Schulterstand bleibt in meinem Kopf immer etwas Luft, so dass ich im Wasser oben schwimme. Ich bin ein Beispiel deutscher Präzision. Schließlich wurde ich von sowjetischen Zwangsarbeitern in deutschen Fabriken produziert. In Coburg. Sie haben Versuche an mir durchgeführt. Immer wieder haben sie mich aus dem zweiten Stock auf den blanken Asphalt fallen lassen. Aber dank meiner abgerundeten Ecken blieb ich auch nach schrecklichsten Strapazen einsatzbereit. Die Alliierten haben Wind von mir bekommen und besorgten sich meine Baupläne von einem amerikanischen Ingenieur, der 1939 mit einem einzigen Wagen, beladen mit einer ganzen Palette von uns, von Deutschland bis nach Indien fuhr und von dort mit einem Schiff nach Amerika. Ich wurde eingelagert, bis ein britischer Soldat endlich auf die Idee kam, mich nachbauen zu lassen. So here we are. Ich wurde zum internationalen Star. Die Briten drehten Propagandafilme mit mir. Jerry comes to come Jerry. Ich wurde vom Feind zum engsten Verbündeten und zum Helden. Überall kam ich zum Einsatz. Ich habe alles gesehen. Entwickelt von den Deutschen, ihre Religion war Eisen und ihr Gott war Blut, habe ich am Ende geholfen, diesem Todeskult einen Todesstoß zu versetzen. Also, warum sind wir noch mal hier? I leave it like I leave it like this. Um, yes. So um, this canister basically tells his story, his version of um, basically how he experienced his his life and how he came to life. And it's um, I would say a visual reference to. Um, the videos that have been made of um, time witnesses, of witnesses that experienced actually uh, these times as victims, victims of the Holocaust or of being part of the, these slave labor camps. So this maybe is uh, what we could say the reference to the whole idea of this um, event, a counter monument, because it also creates a counter narrative to a story that has been told in a way that is, let's say, at least just half of the story or not true at all. The canister was built by the um, company Max Brose Autoteile GmbH. Max Brose was a um, um, strong supporter of the Nazi cause. He was a member of the NSDAP from 33 to 45. And he was also their Wirtschaftsführer. And um, this was also their first mass product. So with this product that they produced for the Wehrmacht, they became a mass producer. And um, after 45, he was also accused of being a supporter of the National Socialism. But his sentence in the end was lowered to keep him in business. Today, we maybe would call it he was too big to fail in a certain way. And um, so he could keep his company. And today, this company is one of the biggest family businesses in Germany with a multi-billion, um, uh, how do you say? Um, I think they make several billions a year. Julia Stoschek is um, the, one of the legal heirs of the family business. So Brose is today. Um, running under the head of the company named Michael Stoschek, who is the grandson of um, Max Brose. 
and Julia Soschek is his daughter, and um, she holds, of course, like um, a, a high position in the company. She's one of the chairs, and this is where she gets the money from to buy art. I would say this is all not totally untypical in Germany. This is basically a very common situation, uh, also in, with, uh, in reference with many collections. What is different, um, though, is, uh, or what is, um, in a way, um, nowadays a bit unique, uh, is how they deal with the past. And this is actually what is interesting for me, um, mainly. Uh, they, this family, the family policy is basically not um, to take any responsibility. They rather um, rewrite their own history, so they hired a historian to write a beautified family history uh, without any sources. This book has no sources at all. It was a big scandal um, in the field of like of uh, history and historical science. They, um, uh, when they presented this book, um, Michael Stoschek said his grandfather couldn't save any Jews, which he would have, because there was no concentration camp in Coburg. <laughs> so this was his <laughs> this was his explanation, <laughs> because he tried to make uh, Max Brose uh, some sort of like a second Schindler or something like this. <laughs> yes, um, and the second very um, I would say interesting event happened 2015 when the family basically bribed the city of Coburg into changing a name, uh, a street uh, name to Max Brose Straße. And um, I would say 2015, we are already at a point where we know, I mean, we are struggling to change it. We had this, we heard this before here um, uh, with the Halit Street in Kassel. So here it actually goes the other way around. <laughs> we name streets after, after Nazis because uh, they can afford it. What they did is they said, we will cancel every cultural funding to the city or any funding if you don't rename the street. They had this project going since 2004, so, 2000, uh, so 11 years they f this family fought for it. By the way, the first party who gave in was Die Linke because they were afraid that uh, uh, Max Brose will um, leave this place and they will lose a lot of jobs. Uh, so <laughs> very in interesting coincidence and how to... Yeah, so, um, and what they, so the family policy is not to talk about it at all, not to um, give in to any of this critique, not really commenting. They have like a very brief statement about some historical facts that are undeniable. What is interesting for me is the, way, or what, what was interesting for me, was the way this work was received. I got a lot of emails by other people who have a lot of, for example, a lot of money who thought, why do you accuse Julia Stoschik, this very nice person who didn't harm anyone, um, who actually supports art a lot and is always very nice to students, they said, uh, why do you do this? She's not guilty. And um, this was, for me, interesting because there is such an, a twisted idea of guilt and what guilt actually means. Um, and I had to think about it a lot, why the rejection of guilt is such a, a central aspect of not coming to terms with history and denying any kind of truth. So in Judaism, <laughs> I mentioned this from a Jewish perspective, in Judaism it's like this. Guilt is the foundation. Without guilt, without the acceptance of guilt, you cannot be an individual. An individual is created only, or can only be created or be functioning as an individual uh, if it understands that it is guilty. 
And guilt, though, doesn't mean you are guilty and you can never um, get out of the guilt, but you can never really overcome guilt. You have to accept that. We are living in a world that is conflicted. We have problems, and this is how we have to deal with it. So we have to constantly come, try to come to terms with this, and this is actually what makes us, let's say, grown-ups <laughs> in the end. So if you do not uh, accept... <laughs> If you do not accept this idea of guilt, if you reject this, you, have to, you will in the end um, create an environment that rejects any kind of truth, also your own truth. So guilt is not only, the rejection of guilt is not only something that we face very prominently in Germany when we deal with the Shoah, it is also what actually led into an ideology that, um, let's say, preconditioned the Shoah. Because the rejection of guilt, the externalization of guilt, of your own conflicts, the idea that we can solve, finally, every conflict and our conflicted life, if we kill a group of people that we mark as the people who bring us conflict, namely the Jews in this case, this is what actually ideologically leads into the Shoah. So there is a continuity of rejection of guilt. And uh, this is uh, something that people react often so immediately to. And dealing with this topic, I must say this is something that every generation again and again has to understand. They have to, if you want to be, if you want to in any way create a culture, a, a progressive or whatever, I mean, uh, the word progressive in the moment is not always very used in a necessarily um, clear way, but if we want to somehow create a, a better world or whatever, we have to take into account these ideas of guilt and in a certain way also truth. And this is why I made this work. And I would like to say this here, because um, I never really said it anyway. First of all, I think I'm the best friend of Julia Stoschek, um, because actually if she would um, just come o uh, overcome this family policy and, for example, uh, say the names of the people who um, had to work there unwillingly for this company, help them to become what they are today. Um, this would give a truth to the story of these people. It's not about money. I mean, they're always afraid. They have to pay money, reparations, and, and, and whatever, the image and whatever. But we know today in Germany, we are very proud of the memorial culture. We are very proud of, of uh, the way Germany dealt with this history. And we can see that this can be, in a certain way, a su successful story for a company like this. So she doesn't want to do this. They don't want to do it. And um, this was basically my intention to make this video, it was never to accuse someone um, or to, yeah, uh, but it was basically to, to, to tell a story that is a counter narrative and it is actually a very important uh, narrative for, for a lot of people who we don't even know the names of, who might not even know that their ancestors had to work there. So, um, yeah. This, is, this was, I, I tried to keep, 25 minutes was what we said, right, what we agreed on. So uh, this is what we had now. Um, everything else I can, if there are certain questions, we can talk about this later, but I think you have an idea about the work now. Thank you, Leon. So you. we will talk later on together with Talia, who is coming now next as our speaker. And I'm very happy that Talia can be here. 
And uh, I think everybody who is from the half PK might Talia know anyway. Talia is a student of the half PK. And we met when you came to the half PK first as a, um, with a grant. And you came to my class and to Sam Durant's class. And we spoke a lot of, about like art, what can art do in a kind of memory culture and memory works, how uh, in what direction you would like to go, and you were very much interested in audio and uh, media work. And then um, you w something happened to you, and like um, my, I, I think everybody knows it here in the hall, you witnessed the uh, attack on the Halle synagogue, and you are a survivor of this uh, Nazi attack. And this really changed, I think, a lot uh, for sure, for you, for your life, and for everything. And so from that on, also the, the, your work is very much focused on this kind of anti-racist um, things what have been going on in Germany. And so we are very glad to have you here now uh, that you will introduce us to your recent practice. And uh, maybe just to some, uh, uh, tell the audience a little more that you are from Denver, Colorado, and, uh, and you studied there at the Art Institute of Chicago before you came here to the Half PK. And uh, you have received this year the Dagesh Art Award. I don't know how to say it. Is it Dagesh or? Yeah. Yeah? Okay. <laughs> For your installation, The Violence We Have Witnessed Carries a Weight on our hearts at the Jewish, Jewish Museum in Berlin. As a survivor of the racist and anti-Semitic attack in Halle um, on October 9th, 2019, uh, Feldman has received global recognition for her sub subsequent projects combating right-wing terror on and offline. So you will speak today on your new, okay. new project, We Isn't Here, We Are Here, for which she works with families of victims, survivors, and initiatives across Germany combating right-wing terror. So please welcome Talia Feldmann. Um, thank you so much. Thank you, Michaela and Nora, for inviting me here, and also to Jana Bieler-Meyer, who unfortunately can't be here today, but who I am also collaborating with on this project, and among many other survivors and affected and relatives of victims of right-wing terror in Germany. Um, I want to start, actually, by um, perhaps even requesting or demanding an urgent call or an urgent change in how we conduct research and how we um, use imagery and language to describe violence. And um, there is a researcher who I follow a lot whose work on indigenous communities uh, her name is Eve Tuck, and what she says is that we must stop this damage-driven data, this damage-driven information that believes that in showing the pain, only the pain and the degradation and the hopelessness of communities that are oppressed, only then can we condemn the oppressor. But in doing so, what we are also doing is we are condemning those communities to that oppression and saying that they are forever broken. And, um, and in a lot of the work that I am doing with relatives and victims and survivors, it is combating these narratives and saying, we are not broken, we are here. And in also in language, in imagery, in sound, we are fighting that fight. And what does remembrance mean for us in that fight? It means changing, and it means listening. And it also means offering alternative narratives that we don't often see when we are speaking about violence in our communities and in our society. And so I would like to also start with an image a recent image from Halle this past year and the second commemoration of the attack in Halle. There was no official um, commemoration by the city. They did not think that that was necessary. 
uh, there was no conversation with the survivors, the affected, the families of the victims as to what they needed and what they wanted for remembrance on this day, on October 9th in 2021. Instead, politicians and the mayor of Halle showed up without permission for their moments of silence and their media, their chance at the media, um, photographs and video uh, to lay down wreaths of flowers. And in, in resistance, um, a number of survivors of the attack in Halle put up these signs. On the Keys Donor, that was also a place of attack where one young man was killed, Kevin S. We said, kein Gedenken ohne Betroffene. There can be no remembrance without the affected. What does it mean, remembrance like this, when politicians show up for one moment of silence without any kind of consequence, without any kind of accountability, without any kind of change, and without listening to the voices of survivors and those affected and to their demands and their needs. And so this project that I am working on now is a digital project. And the digital project is a way of claiming what is rightfully ours when it comes to remembrance in the public space. And we are claiming those spaces in the digital space because we are, as, as yesterday you heard so often in our cities, we are met with institutions and politicians like these who refuse to give us that space. And so we take that space. And I would like to also quote um, a fellow survivor, Ibrahim Arslan, who survived a neo-Nazi arson attack in 1992 in Mon. In a statement, he speaks, with each day that the stories of those taken from us are told, we know that no one can take the pain away. We can and must carry the questions and demands of the relatives and friends of the murdered and the injured. We see and hear that during official commemorations, the affected families are again and again robbed of their little trust in the institutions. It may be that the stage for a production belongs to them. However, the commemoration, the remembering as well as the denunciation of what happened belongs only to the survivors and the relatives of the murdered. Therefore, we reclaim the memory which belongs to us. Reclaim and remember, fight for the memory. We, the relatives and survivors of the racist acts, have been fighting for many years for a dignified remembrance. To fight for remembrance is for us a constant mourning. To fight for remembrance is the certainty that nothing is given to us by itself. No remembrance, no justice, no clarity. This project is also able in this digital space to view memory as something that is not past, but as something that is present and that is future. Memory is not linear. Remembrance is not linear. History is not linear. And so in looking at these acts of violence and these memories through the perspective of those who are consistently and constantly fighting for that remembrance and for that change, um, this sound or how we imagine, how we tune into the world, how we can believe that change is possible is here in the voices of the affected, in the voices of the relatives of the victims, in the voices of survivors of right-wing terror. And so in this digital project, which actually is in progress, but um, it's also going to be featured in part soon um, by the Kunstverein in, in Hamburg, uh, in the KV digital series that they are now starting. It's also going to be, over the next few years, featured by the, uh, the 
center for victim counseling centers in Germany that work with affected and victims and relatives of racist and anti-Semitic violence. So it is a project that will continue over time, which is also key in this conversation of remembrance in that remembrance, like grief, it also changes. It isn't static. And similarly, the digital space is also not static and it changes over time. And so for us, it was very important that these names and this, this project exists virtually and that it also exists forever and that it also exists as something that is able to evolve. Um, and so what the project is and looks like is also related to um, a few years ago, I came across um, an accident, an algorithm accident that happened uh, with a real estate company. They had an online digital space where suddenly, because of a mistake in the algorithm, you could see outlines of buildings that were once there beneath highways and toll roads that were built and bulldozed these homes and these buildings. And it became very evident as a political statement that these buildings and homes belonged to people who were of a certain class, certain race, who were removed from those homes for these highways and these toll roads and these spaces. And I thought how powerful that you can look at a map and you can see what was over what is. And in approaching this project, how powerful could it be to look at maps of Germany and see what could be over what is? And so what this project is doing is with each name of victim, with each family working closely with them, we are claiming these spaces, imagining an alternative to what remembrance could be in our city streets, in our schools, in our parks. And so with every person, remembrance, of course, looks different. Some are claiming streets, some are claiming buildings, some are claiming schools to be renamed, some are claiming simply spaces where they can gather and be together in solidarity and resistance and resilience. And so in going through these, I also will say that this project is called We Are Sin Here, We Are Here. We are here in that, as Farouk Arslan says, Farouk Arslan, the father and the relative of three murdered in Moon, Behida Arslan, Yelis Arslan and Aisha Yilmaz says, we will always be here. We are speaking, we have been speaking all along and it is time to listen to us. At the same time, you have the mother of, for instance, Burak Bektash, who says, what does remembrance mean for me in renaming a park and renaming this space where Burak was murdered by neo-Nazis in 2012? It means that no more Buraks will die. It means that there will be an end to this violence. Similarly, the mother of Sedat Gurbuz, Emish Gurbuz, Sedat, who was murdered in Hanau in 2020 on the 19th of February, Emish, who says the remembrance means it, it exists, that it exists wherever she is, wherever, whatever city, whatever street, whatever place. It's a fire that is burning and evolving and that cannot be extinguished. And I think it's important to hear all of these different recollections, all these different reflections on what remembrance means, because remembrance is not one thing and it is not static and it is forever evolving and changing, just like grief, just like pain, just like anger, just like hope. Similarly, um, Samra Ertan, so in Hamburg, the fight for a street called Samra Ertan Strasse has been ongoing for the family of Samra Ertan for many, many years. And this project not only brings forward these, this, these images of maps of what could be, what should be in our city streets and in our city spaces, 
but it also brings the voices of those who are fighting and continuing to fight and what they recollect. And in so doing, it also is fighting through sound. It is fighting within the public space to take over the sounds that so often permeate our society in violence, in militarized police, in, in ambulances, in how we connect or how we think about violence in the public space it also exists in the sounds that overcome us and in the political sphere of what who is heard and who is not and in what voices are allowed to speak and which voices are not and I think it's important to recollect in this saying that we are here is also saying we have been speaking all along and it, and again and again it is time to listen and so this alternative as what I mentioned in the beginning um, offering these alternatives and also what Leon mentioned and offering alternative narratives to the common narratives that we so often hear in relation to violence is also offering alternatives that are speaking from places of resistance and power, of resilience, but also of poetry. Oh, let's see if I can play. Ich will leben, wie ich es mir wünsche, schmerzlos, ohne Sorgen. Ich will lieben, geliebt werden, wie es sich mein Herz erträumt. Mit reinem Herzen möchte ich erfahren die Schönheit der Welt, schöne Menschen. Ich will leben, wie es sich mein Herz erträumt. Von 1982, Samuel Ertan. project, we are taking the space on the maps, <laughs> but we are also filling the spaces, these public spaces, with sounds, with our voices of resistance and resilience, with our demands for remembrance and solidarity, and uh, in also doing so, it also, in a way, the project is also reflecting on this concept of when we look at maps and we say, you are here, we are here, where are we also as a society in reflecting on these, this street, this street that the family of Summer Artan wants to claim within the city of Hamburg. How many people know that this is the street that the family has been fighting to claim for so many years? How many know that Summer Artan was here on this street? And I think it is um, in our way uh, an act of resistance in this project, but also in adapting it as well over time and recognizing again, as I mentioned before, that remembrance changes and that similarly to grief, it will always change. And, uh, and so I think maybe I can leave it there. Um, I'm happy to answer questions in the in this uh, Q&A that we will soon have and uh, thank you thank you for your time <laughs> Thank you, Talia. Thank you, Leon, for this input. And um, I think it's it's um, 
now really on the point. We are in an art school and we can think what kind of strategies we can use to address uh, certain topics we have in, in mind. And I think um, coming back to your project, you claim the, the digital space to bring in the voices of people who live here and want to be heard since many years and are still examples or hopefully not for more cases that will come up. So this is kind of uh, the tragic with your project. Will you go on? Just would be my first question because uh, I'm afraid, but uh, I would guess that we have this heavy problem not only in Germany, but especially in Germany, with these attacks, right-wing attacks, fascist attacks. And so it's kind of, it will be a huge cloud over that country. I'm quite sure what you are working on. Um, yeah, I mean, I think also in this question of remembrance, it's also a question of uh, how, how are things remembered? And I think in a lot of cases, uh, so many acts of violence are not even categorized or have not been categorized as anti-Semitic or racist attacks. And so I think over time, more and more that clarification and those demands from families and also initiatives that have even in recent years begun to emerge demanding for justice, demanding for more information about certain deaths, certain murders in certain cities, um, that also will, will contribute to the project because um, there are names even in this project of people who also were killed from police brutality and police violence, and they are not, they have not yet received that justice. And so um, I think it also is that, it is questioning that, who is controlling that memory, and um, how do we then overcome that kind of narrative as well? Yeah, I'm just thinking uh, that for many years now, um, only the, the big newspapers only have this small, like two um, lines quotes on things like happened like that. And so there had to be like different archives where you could look up what happened. And so for example, here in Hamburg, there was the, or is the newspaper Concrete, and they had every month in the issue, they had listed what they collected, for example, and there had been web websites. And so it's increasing, so this is, um, the thing what I thought with your project. So I hope you ha have a lot of contribute, uh, uh, people who are in collision with you that you can, can ha bear this load on your shoulders because it's really heavy to work with these things, to meet all these people who survived and uh, experienced this uh, pain and uh, horror in a way. And so maybe trying to come to Leon, I think um, it, it is uh, very important that uh, you do this thing because, uh, like, I, I don't know, it, I think it was 12 years ago when this was uh, this totally um, thing in the media that uh, it was about the Flick collection in the Hamburger Bahnhof and the, the Flick uh, guy who owns the collection, he didn't want to pay for the first workers. And at that time, the German parliament decided that every big factory who had forced laborers and slaves, I would say, they had to find these people, and many of them still lived, and to give at least, it was something like 5,000 uh, uh, euros a person, so it's nothing. Uh, and the same thing is for the Stoschek family, or Baruse family, they, uh, they, have, they know who is working there because they have the list of the people, because they had to, to look where, where they uh, stay, and every small city has that, and so only if they burned it, I don't know. But uh, they could find out the, the relatives, and they could pay at least the, the money what the state uh, wants them to do. And this is so uh, really hard. 
um, f full disclosure, they did pay some amount to EVZ, mm -hmm. to this, um, to this big yeah, to this pot. pot of money. But um, this is just part of it. I think, I mean, of course it's about money, but on the other end, of course, it's you cannot nothing. really, you cannot really, it's nothing, and which sum would be the right sum, you cannot evaluate life really with money. Um, so I always think, um, the act of paying or also making it official is, of course, a form of uh, recognition, right? If you pay for something, you recognize, you say, okay, we admit this is what happened. But I remember this documentary, always this one image about um, the um, Quant family who owns um, BMW. There's a scene where a former um, forced labor worker uh, stands in front of um, the factory where he worked and where he also was imprisoned. And he's crying and he says he's just asking for, um, for the family to admit his, his story. And this is what this is about. So, and this is what Bosa is not doing. They can, uh, I don't care what they pay or s paid somewhere. They, you know, they transferred some money somewhere uh, to a German fund and they give, pay some projects. But um, as you right, we said, he is, they are not um, giving out the names. Let's hope they, they still have it somewhere and one day we, they w the names will be uh, published. Um, I tried of course, in the whole research for the project to find the names. Um, I had some contacts where it seemed that there is a possibility, but in the end I couldn't find anything. The city is also not very collaborative because of course they are the biggest, they pay the most taxes in Coburg, so yeah. And, but, Co and yeah. Coburg is the first city in Germany who had the heart out of Hitler place, just to say that. Yeah, they were the first. <laughs> I would like just to say one other thing about um, memory because um, of because memory, I mean, what it serves for is, of course, somehow an uh, enlightening society. So memory is, of course, f first of all, for the, victim, uh, for the victims, but I think the biggest burden also for the victims is that they somehow carry uh, on their shoulders a process that the whole society benefits from. And I just say that because I also find it important that people, the whole society, also people who are not victims, understand this benefit and also feel the possibility that they can participate in these ideas of solidarity and that they can have a voice here and that they can be active um, and that they are being included in the idea of memory because it's a process of enlightenment and this is what concerns everyone and this is only what I wanted to say that there is there are several layers I would say that I just can uh, tell or uh, answer to that. Uh, when I did these interviews with people for my projects, they all said, we know our story, uh, but you have to know them. And so um, many of them, they also didn't go to any um, memorial commem commemorating events, uh, what, what politics do, because they can't bear it, because they just felt it like uh, it would be some uh, relief once a year or something, and this kind of dropping some uh, like uh, flowers and some some words, but uh, nothing has changed. So uh, it's like you said, they want to be um, heard with their voices, and this is maybe a possibility what art could do in that case, and maybe also help uh, to bring out the list of the Brose um, uh, seller. I don't know where they have it, but the city also has to have it. Uh, and, the, and the most tragic thing about that is, uh, when I did research on a, a big munition camp near Munich, where it was all run by forced workers, and uh, they had in the city uh, archive, they had hundreds of letters from 
France, from Poland, from for the Baltic states, where people wrote, I worked there as a first labor, and um, I want to be accepted for it to get some, um, yeah, some, something that people know that I had to do that. And the, the, the city was totally um, overfordered. Uh, they, they didn't know what to do. And then at the end, there came this big pot, this money where it was officially spread. But if these people would get it, because you have then to tell the addresses and the people maybe don't live anymore. And this is an ongoing thing, like what you have in your project now, that when people still lived in the 80s, and they might not live in the 90s or in this years now. Yeah, I, I mean, I think to also say um, that I agree. And I think that in this concept of listening and how we frame remembrance as well is that, is that remembrance looks different for every person. And that it is something that society as a whole must bear. Absolutely. And I think that in listening to the voices of affected over the voices of perpetrators, for instance, looking at images of victims and of their families over the images of perpetrators, over the uh, headlines and the sensationalism of violence that we so often see in the media, in the courtrooms, in, in law enforcement, that is also, also in sound um, that I mentioned putting these alternative narratives over those is important if we are to change as a society and grow in solidarity together. And, uh, and so I think that it, there is a lot of power in um, tuning into the world differently, certainly, and also offering alternative um, ways of looking at the world. And that is also, I think, what this project is trying to do. So how many uh, collaborators do you have uh, beside of China? <laughs> um, so far, very uh, many. <laughs> and, um, and I think it's also growing. And it's also, um, it's also very powerful to know all the different ways that uh, voices can sound that silence can also sound, like you said, that is an act of resistance to say we will not go to these public displays of remembrance. That certainly is. And, um, and I think there is a lot of power in that silence as well. And um, I, so I, I am certainly the project is um, one way of doing it. There are so many, of course, other ways as well as of approaching this and um, viewing resistance and resilience. And uh, but this is, yeah, this is our way for now, or one way. And uh, and so far, it's uh, working with a number of cities and individuals across Germany. Some with initiatives, some not. Um, some single families who are only now speaking um, because I think that's also part of the responsibility of society is what does it mean when victims and survivors are not heard and not seen and not believed. So I think there's also that, that um, we as a society hold the responsibility to create spaces where people are heard. Maybe a last question to Leon. So how could we deal as artists so, so often we are in conflicted situations that these big collections have this kind of money in the back where there's a really dirty story behind. What do, what do you do? I mean, we cannot ex ask them to uh, pay reparations on the one hand and then say they shouldn't buy art. <laughs> I mean, I think they should buy art. I think they should even pay buy more art. Should and, spend on art. And, <laughs> and support artists and positions, and, uh, which maybe is a way to create uh, such spaces. Um, especially since this is a topic that becomes more and more prominent and debated further and further, like it, it, there was already a lot of change. I think it's really a cultural question. Um, I also try always to make a difference between memory and memorial culture, because memory is, you know, sometimes, I mean, it's important, you know, we can, but 
there must be something, there must be some practical use for it. Um, since I did this already before, this little reference to Judaism, also this is a very <laughs> typical traditional practice in Judaism that you always memorize all the time, you memorize, you memorize, but always in combination to like uh, uh, with a um, practical use for our everyday life. And I think if we think about it like this, if um, there is behind this the idea of enlightening our circumstances and so on, then it's fine. I mean, this is what I expect from a collection like Julia Stoschik. She is not, uh, she didn't have her own, uh, like herself, um, slave labor or forced labor camps. She didn't run those camps, but this, this is a question of responsibility. And if we want to be a responsible society, we want to buy art responsibly or fund art or fund all kind of things, then this is part of it. It's not enough to make uh, exhibitions that deal with the topic of uh, colonialism or uh, slavery if you don't talk about your own history. So you cannot, also by this you cannot buy out of it. It's about self-reflection and coming to terms with this history and make way for all these different stories. And then I think it, yeah. yeah one way would be that she buys your work. <laughs> But yes, many people said say. that, but under, <laughs> under these conditions right now, I wouldn't sell it to her. But she could, I mean, she, the price would be cheap. She wouldn't, you know, but she would have to name the names somehow um, yeah, and the, enlighten the story. Then the she could have to, <laughs> I would even give it to her for free, but with some canisters that she could I, I just, I just thought of that uh, conflict within the <laughs> Flick collection like you might remember, the prominent uh, painting in that collection is the painting by Kippenberger, Ich kann beim besten Willen kein Hakenkreuz erkennen, and that is the center of the collection. <laughs> yeah. So it's... Uh, I mean, seriously, she, the year that they renamed the street in Coburg, Julia Stoschek um, had a big show in Israel, no one knew about it over there. No one knew about the history. I mean, seriously, what should, what if you, if this comes out and the people are confronted with the story, what should they do? You, you drag everyone inside your, your shit, you know? I mean, it's, it creates what we call today often a toxic environment for all the artists that are in the collection. You have to deal with it. They have to create some, some kind of um, cognitive, dissonant stories why they can still be in the collection. It's like it's, a, it's unbearable for everyone, you know? And that's actually what, what, uh, the, what I, for me is important. So. Okay, uh, are there any questions in our audience? No, it's too early maybe for questions. <laughs> so let's uh, do a break now and thank you Talia and Leon for Thank you, Talia. So please help yourself with some coffee, tea, water, whatever.
geht es jetzt? Darf ich jetzt schon anfangen? Okay. Let me present to you a very dear colleague from Helsinki, Mina Henriksson. Mina Henriksson is uh, an artist um, and, uh, and an activist, an anti-fascist activist with a Nordic perspective. And I think that this is actually very important for us here to bring questions like this in our discussions and um, what I learned, I have worked with Mina for many years. We also gave seminars together on questions of para monuments and counter monuments. And what I learned from her is actually to understand how the discourse and the image politics, the art, artist, the history of art and the history politics of art have shaped the folkish self-understanding in the North in the beginning of the 20th century, at the end of the 90th and the beginning of the 20th century. So actually from Mina I learned what we want to look at in the next years, to look differently at Jugendstil and to see how deeply entangled the also art is with the history of the Folkish movement, anti-Semitism and colonialism. So this is something to research on for the next years. So I hope that in five years we will come back with a conference on that topic. But now I'm just glad that Mina agreed to join and bring us a bit of an anti-fascism that comes, that comes with a knowledge from the north of Europe, with also struggles from the north of Europe. So as a visual artist, you work with a disparate range of tools, including text, drawing, and lino cut. You studied in Brighton, in Helsinki, and Malmö. And your work is, yeah, your work is often collaborative, relates to the anti-racist, leftist, feminist, anti-fascist, and communist struggles, also against anti-communism in the history of art. In recent years, your work has often dealt with archives and histories. And you have been invited to many exhibitions in Stockholm, in Bergen, in Vienna. Mina also got this anti-fascist award that we were already talking about yesterday, that Heber Amin got, uh, the Henry, Heinrich Sussmann Award and Annie and Heinrich Sussmann Award. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm really happy that you're here and that we can continue to sing together. So please. Uh, thank you very much, Nora and Mihaela, for inviting me here. It's really nice to be here in Hamburg and part of this uh, conference, which has a very important topic. Um, yes, so uh, my talk today, uh, I think, stands out as a bit different from, from what we have heard in the past days. And I have also, as Nora mentioned, uh, been working quite a lot on, on the topics of uh, racist and fascist and Nazi uh, memorials and signs in public spaces, especially in the Nordic countries and Finland. Uh, yeah, and I'm currently based in Helsinki, so especially there. But uh, today I will speak about something different. Um, uh, yes, I, I will speak about Lenin memorials and remembering Lenin. Uh, and I have two case studies. Uh, one is in Finland um, and the other one is Riga in Latvia. And um, so I have made um, several installations about about Lenin or how Lenin has been remembered in, in Finland and in Riga. Um, I made these installations around 2012 and 2013. And, but since then I've also been following to these um, cases. So here first I'm showing some images of these installations very briefly. Um, this one was in the Lenin Museum in Tampere, uh, which has since then transformed quite a bit. Um, 
Yes, and, and uh, yeah, so when we are talking about um, fascism and, uh, and kind of presence of fascism um, in our surroundings, I also, well, I think that we also need to speak about anti-communism, which is also very present and uh, has been, and, and these two are somehow very connected in a way there would not be fascism without anti-communism, I would say, or, or, or it has been an important element in it, uh, along with racism. And, uh, so, um, in Finland there are two outdoor Lenin monuments, still today. Uh, one is in Turku. Um, it was uh, erected in 1977. It was a gift from uh, the friendship city of Turku, Leningrad. And this statue is uh, made by Mikhail Anitschusin, uh, a Russian sculptor. It's in front of the Turku Art Museum. And uh, the other one is in Kotka. Uh, and this one was uh, erected in 1979. Uh, two years after the Turku monument, and uh, it's a gift from Tallinn, a friendship city of Kotka. And uh, it's made by Estonian artist Matti Varik. Um, and um, in addition, there are several, oh, there, there have been erected several memorial plates uh, in places where Lenin has stayed uh, in Finland. Um, um, and um, here is an image from the archives. Uh, uh, so, uh, yeah, what I think is interesting is that, that all of these Lenin memorial plates and uh, Lenin statues have been erected in 1960s or 1970s. Um, so, um, yeah, why are there all these Lenins? in uh, Finland. Um, one reason is that, uh, in fact, uh, Lenin, uh, well, Finland became independent in 1917, and so uh, soon after the Bolshevik Revolution, um, and, um, and the independence declaration was signed by Lenin as part of uh, his uh, ideas about uh, self-determination of all nations. Um, and, um, and also Lenin stayed uh, long times in Finland uh, in the times before the, the, the revolution. So, so in, the, in the early 19th century, uh, altogether maybe two years uh, when he was fleeing from Russia to, to Europe. Um, and also, for example, he wrote The State and Revolution, one of his most important books in Finland. So, yes, and, and uh, the, the, the last, uh, the last uh, uh, Lenin monument is not actually a Lenin monument. So in Helsinki there is no Lenin statue, but there is instead a, a statue uh, titled World Peace. Uh, so um, as late as uh, 1989, uh, Moscow uh, uh, wanted to give a gift to Helsinki and, uh, and uh, they, they wanted to give a Lenin statue, but uh, but then the mayor of Helsinki managed to, to change it into another statue, and so, so this statue was given instead, and it's a, it's a statue to world peace, which is in quite a central location in, in Helsinki. It's, it's, a, it's made by O.S. Kirjuhin, and it was erected in 1990. And over the years it has been um, tarred and feathered several times, uh, and vandalized in, in many other ways, and in 2010 uh, it was tried to be exploded as well. And now, very recently, uh, there was a decision made that it will be moved just a couple of uh, 
100 meters, uh, but into a much, much less prominent place. Um, and there is also Lenin Park in Helsinki. Uh, so this park was uh, renamed from Rose Park to Lenin Park in 1970. And uh, at this moment, it was also uh, planned to, to have a statue there, but, uh, but the statue was not erected. Um, so, uh, yeah, so, so all these uh, memorials and statues uh, in Finland commemorating Lenin, they were not erected after 1917 when Finland became independent and so, so Lenin was not celebrated as some kind of hero uh, giving Finland independence, but rather these, uh, these statues were erected in 60s and 70s in the time of uh, politics of Finlandization in Finland. So, yeah, it's a, Finlandization is actually a term uh, referring to a country, a smaller country that, that is trying to please a bigger country and, uh, and therefore does everything what this bigger country uh, wants them to do. So, 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 so these um, statues to Lenin are a, a symptom of, of this kind of politics that took place in Finland when Finland could not refuse the gifts that were given from Soviet Union. Um, but but uh, since then, uh, Finland, uh, in Finland, there is a politics that, um, that although times change, uh, streets are not renamed and uh, statues are not toppled because uh, this is what is happening in the less democratic um, Eastern Bloc countries or has been happening. Uh, and uh, so in Finland, um, um, yeah, somehow uh, they cannot take away these statues although, and, and parks, although perhaps they would like to. So, so this is, uh, here is for example, an image from the Lenin Park uh, where these, these letters uh, are constantly being removed and uh, yeah, like this is not very much taken care of. Or this is the Lenin statue in Turku where you cannot read who it is uh, commemorating. Um, and, and in fact, um, this, this statue in Turku uh, was, uh, uh, there was, um, yeah, so, so they could not refuse the statue, but, but they wanted to make it disappear nevertheless. So, so they were, the, the Turku city gardening department uh, made a, a decision not to cut the trees that are growing around the statue. So, uh, so, so for, for a long time it was very hidden uh, underneath and behind bushes and trees. But then this building uh, next to this uh, statue, there was a facade renovation and the scaffolding needed to be put there. Yeah, here is still the hidden Lenin. So, so then they were renovating this house and, and all the trees needed to be cut. And nowadays it is very bare since, since maybe 10 years. And, and since then this Lenin is, uh, is much more a target of vandalism. Uh, here is the memorial plate next to it. So, so, so nowadays students are gathering there and uh, not uh, very much uh, uh, commemorating and respecting this uh, Lenin statue. Uh, and another, for example, another uh, thing that I found was um, in Lahti, in another city in Finland. Um, here is a building where Lenin stayed. Um, and, and there has been the plate, the plate was installed on the wall saying that Lenin stayed here. Um, but I couldn't find the, the plate anywhere, so I asked the janitor who was fixing something outside the building and, and 
and this person said, oh, you want to see that plate? It's in my cabinet, come and see. So, so then this person took me to their uh, cleaning cabinet and, uh, and that's where the plate was lying and, and this is already years and years ago and it's still not installed. So, um, and another, this is in the center of Helsinki, the plate has just disappeared. So, so this has been the destiny of the uh, Lenin memorials in Finland somehow, uh, kind of, they have not been officially removed, but in other ways they have just disappeared. Whereas in Riga, um, um, there uh, was the, the Lenin statue standing in the, in the very center of the city uh, since 1950, and this was removed in 1991 uh, as a very symbolic gesture of, of uh, Riga liberating itself from the occupation of Soviet Union. Uh, and, and it, was, it has been said that it was, uh, it was done by the people, but in fact it was, uh, it was done by the, the, the Riga city. The, the cranes came and, uh, and removed it. And so I went looking for this Lenin statue and uh, I couldn't find it anywhere. Uh, it was said that it is kept in some storage and guarded 24 hours a day but then I discovered that it's not there and so uh, I could, um, yeah, I, I, I was searching for, for the statue and traces of it, so I've only found Pravda in, in a graffiti or Iskra in a sailing boat. Uh, but um, yeah, then in the end, um, I, I heard from somebody, a researcher, that it might be in the south side of the river in, a, in an industrial area and um, and I was just walking there in the kind of looking through the fences and I saw something that kind of looked like it could have been the Lenin statue and um, so uh, yeah it, then in fact uh, I got the permission yeah, I was working with an art organization and uh, uh, we contacted the owner of this area and uh, he did not want to speak to us, but he opened the gates and I could go and photograph it. Uh, and uh, yes, there was the Lenin statue. And um, yeah, in quite a bad condition. So, so what had happened is that this uh, private entrepreneur had bought this area of the city or this uh, warehouse area some five years earlier and uh, they were not perhaps aware in the city that, that this Lenny statue had been moved there and, and was, uh, was kept there. So, so, so when this uh, person bought this area also he got this Lenin statue into his possession. And since then, the, the, the Riga city uh, uh, heritage and statue protection agency, uh, they are trying to get, get this statue back because uh, yeah, that they, they had plans that they could make a sculpture park where they could put all these um, Lenin statues and other statues uh, as has been done in Lithuania. Uh, and in Lithuania, this park is, is, a, is a big tourist attraction nowadays, but, but they were somehow late and, uh, and they cannot get, get this Lenin statue back. So, which has perhaps become valuable in the meanwhile. So, yes. Um, well, um, in the end, I would, um, uh yeah so 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 back to helsinki uh there is uh there is this uh, lenin park and um uh every now and then uh starts a discussion about whether a lenin statue should be placed in this lenin park in helsinki and 
well, I think that a relevant question would be that if a Lenin statue would uh, be erected in the park, what kind of a statue would it be? And um, um, there is a, a bronze statue uh, that was in the Lenin Museum, perhaps some, some people have been proposing that this would go into the Lenin Park, or then a private doctor in Helsinki has this statue in his garage, which is also waiting to go to the Lenin Park. Uh, he would donate it there if, if the decision was made. Um, but um, uh, I would, uh, yeah, uh, yes, so, so I think that it's a valid um, question to think about uh, whether it is a suitable way of uh, remembrance to erect bronze or granite statues of men, or should we rather make a monument that carries the ideas that Lenin and his movement propagated. So should the, uh, should the monument be permanent and fixed, or could it follow the practice of the early Bolsheviks, who made temporary monuments out of plywood and cardboard, and the idea was that they could be moved from one street corner to another and replaced when needed. So, what could be a, cont a contemporary form of uh, remembering anti-fascist and leftist struggles? And uh, one example um, of a different kind of monument, which is not even so new, is from London. Um, there is a Marx Memorial Library, which was founded in 1933 at the Clerkenwell Green. Uh, so this uh, library was uh, erected uh, on the 50th anniversary of the death of Karl Marx, uh, for which occasion a delegate meeting was held comprising representatives of trade unionists, leftist parties, etc. Uh, the same year also saw Germany burning books, uh, yeah, with the determination to root out all Marxist and other progressive ideas. In these circumstances, the meeting resolved that the most appropriate memorial would be a library. Uh, thus, the Marx Memorial Library and School was established at 37A Clerkenwell Green that same year. Uh, and the library holds an impressive number uh, and variety of archives and collections, and still today continues uh, work of collecting published and archival materials about Marxism, trade unionism, and the working class movement, and makes them available through lectures and educational courses. So this is my proposal for a, a memorial, perhaps in the Lenin Park as well. Uh, and if uh, we have one more minute, Okay, uh, I, would, I would still like to, to show perhaps another um, monument or paramonument uh, from another, totally another location where I've also been looking at uh, uh, anti-fascist monuments or, or trying to search them. Uh, so this is from Yashi in Romania where there were three uh, anti-fascist monuments erected uh, after the Second World War in the end of 40s and early 50s. And each one of them has disappeared after, uh, yeah, in the, in the end of 1980s or early, or like by the end of 1990s. So, um, Let me... Oh, oh, sorry. Uh. Oh, no, sorry. Yeah, I didn't want the sound. Okay. Thank you, yeah. Ok, 
Can I not talk? Okay, no. Ah, okay, I can talk. So, okay. So, so yes, now it went already, but maybe you saw this, uh, this tram line making a curve. Um, so, uh, so, so here in, in, in Yashi, in Romania, at the Kopo Hill, uh, there used to be an anti-fascist statue, and although the statue is not there anymore, uh, but there is now just a clumsy arrangement of flowers on top of a base of the statue. Um, so, but the curve itself is a, a kind of a monument. Uh, it's an everyday reminder for those who uh, once saw the statue there of what has been made invisible and destroyed by the the post-1989 administration. Thank you very much, Mina. From your proposal of um, an actualization of the idea of the memorial through a place of research and a place no. of debate and collaborative memorial practice, I think it's a very good move to come back to Lünhan Balatbad Helbog, that we already know as a curator and researcher, and um, who is working in actually such a place, a place that is at the same time a library and an archive and a place of active collaborative memorial practice. So thank you for being with us, Lynn and here's the word to you. Thank you so much. Thanks again for having us uh, and massive gratitude also to all the organizers of this uh, beautiful conference and all the people who participated and shared their research and their work. I want to start with um, a presentation about um, absence in contemporary archives. And I've chosen the title 130 and one bodies in a garden full of ghosts. And the reason uh, why I use this title is uh, that I thought, in, especially in, the, in regards to the restitution question or memory, a lot of things are being left out, meaning the, the objects, you know, the, the places where we penetrate or things are stored are felt like empty spaces, like ghosts that are haunted. And these ghosts that are basically entities that are absent of agency. And I want to come to a very sad commemoration, which is the Song Massacre, and a very uncanny um, way to put this in parallel because not many people did uh, talk about the death of the 27 bodies that drowned in the channel between France and the UK and one of the people who actually mentioned this was Olu Gib in a talk like two uh, days ago when we had the test and for those of you who don't uh, know of the song Massacre here uh, a book by Nobese Phillips. So the Song Massacre was a mass killing of more than 130 enslaved Africans by the crew of the British slave ship Song on and in the days following and of 29th of November 1781. So it's a 240 years of commemoration. As was common business practice, they had taken out insurance on the lives of the enslaved people as cargo. According to the crew, when the ship ran low on drinking water, following navigational mistakes, the crew threw enslaved people overboard. After the slave ship reached port at Black River, Jamaica, Song's owners made a claim to their insurers for the loss of the enslaved people. When the insurers refused to pay, the resulting court cases 
held that in some circumstances the murder of enslaved people was legal and that insurers could be required to pay for those who had died. And I want to draw the attention to the uncanny relation towards these two countries now, France and Britain, that blame each other and no one is being held accountable for these 27 lives that are gone and that we that are absent in the agencies can talk about uh, can talk talk for themselves and many to follow of course and yeah and so in case you have not uh, uh, read yet the book by Nobese Phillips it's a beautiful way to uh, commemorate, commemorate through language and uh, Nobese Phillips herself she uh, comes from a law background uh, project that we've done at Savi Contemporary called Vul Vulnerable Archives, Silenced Archives and Dissenting Views, was basically an archive um, that revolved around the fragile, vulnerable ones we are addressing or who are absent while we are addressing them. And uh, these bodies are not silent per se, they do have a voice, but one that can be silenced. So, yeah, this voice um, is a very potent airing might that is not listened to. And in this project we collaborated with archives and organizations that engage in strategies of alternative history writing, dissent, self-organization and participation via practical solidarity. We are creating al alliances to develop tools to strengthen strategies of speech spaces of listening. The Vulnerable Archives project understands vulnerability as a method with the potential of continuous creative sources of knowledge. So since 2020, we were working with various partners in Germany, communities in Turkey, Italy and also France. And the aim was here really to build a dialogue amongst the communities that have been silenced and denied from archival practices in order to shed light on the overlooked efforts and unconventional ways of storing collective memories. And in September 2021, so a few months ago, we also had an exhibition with Billy Bijoka, who delved on the question of vulnerable archives. So in his research exchanges, also to name them, because the form of naming is very important, we worked with After the Archive, with Kürgen Ergun and Kürtigin Kagan Akbulut, Daniel Baker from the Roma MoMA, Library Hamze Bitici from the Roma Trial, Kabit Ebo Eno von Ioto, Chiara Figone from Archive Books, Özlem Kaya, Philip Cabo uh, Köpsel from Ioto, uh, Olivier Maboeuf, who had the space in uh, France called Chiasma in the Periphery, and Katerina Katerzina Pabjanek and Anna Mirga Kruselnika von Eriak, and Justin Randolph Thompson from the Recovery Plan. As Nora already mentioned, we have various archives at Savi Contemporary that have uh, different motivations or different forms. One is the Savi Doc, uh, but this will be too much now in this 20 minutes gap to talk about the Savi Doc, which is a um, library documentation center. And on the other hand, we have the Colonial Neighbors Archive, which is basically very schizophrenic in its form to a conventional archive because we kind of take into consideration that uh, the conservative format of an archive is very fascist. Who can penetrate uh, an archive? Who can go see the objects that are basically stored dead in these coffins? Who can like touch and be in touch and have this haptic uh, intervention also towards these objects? So basically we try to also take advantage that we are not a museum and luckily we don't have to follow the strategies also the um, forms that a museum is imposing over uh, display formats um, so in our archive projects here you see a display of uh, an accumulation of replicas of Bismarck's head we try to always reinvent the form and be um, critical over how representation of toxic objects work. So just as a small intro, the Colonial Neighbors Archive was 
uh, has been starting with this object, with um, this Cameroon album that very randomly found its way to Bonaventure Sobeng Dikung, the founder of Savi Contemporary. And it was a very naive form, which is almost something like a, a travel journal by a German soldier. And he dedicated this book to his parents. And in this Cameroon album where he... Um, gathered images from his one year uh, being stationed in Cameroon. He has images that say like naively, this uh, females, these are the fruit, these are the landscape, but very clearly you see places of violence. And um, there are some images where you have uh, Würmern Faktoreien. And Kevin also did the walk yesterday who very uh, clearly points out how the Wehrmann, Wehrmann family were a key um, figure in this process of colonialism, forced labor, uh, working camps, and also death. So basically we gather objects that are connected to the uh, colonial period of time. And a lot of times these are objects that have um, racist image, be it uh, package material, be it uh, beer coasters, etc. And in this momentum, we are very stuck between researching, opening up, connecting towards the stories behind the objects and connecting from that violent past to the violent now. But we also kind of like trapped in not wanting to perpetuate this violent image on top of the object. So here you have um, something that inspired us also in the way we thought about the archive. So by Achille Membe, where he says, the archive therefore is fundamentally a matter of discrimination and of selection, which in the end results in the granting of a privileged status to certain written documents and the refusal of that some status to others thereby judged unarchivable. The archive is therefore not a piece of data, but a status. So we try to also see um, which bodies walk into the archives because you can't serve certain needs. So different bodies have different urgencies. So if a um, black or a POC person is in a space of uncomfort because you know like the archive speaks in a way that strips you of your dignity you really need to question the way you um, form the display of this archive so we played with different forms formats where we try to put uh, we always try to put things in case we display them outside so people can really touch it and also get this uh, notion of the hierarchy off so things are basically just laid out there and I personally believe not everything is meant to, to last. So we see things decaying in front of our eyes and that's okay. Um, sometimes we put pl place things in boxes and you're free to turn them away. So you're not, you, you, you make things invisible and you shut things off. Here we have something else that inspired us uh, by Derrida where he says, um, there is no political power without control of the archive, if not memory. Effective democratization can always be measured by this essential criterion, the participation in and access to the archive, its constitution and its interpretation. So again, the access to the archive was very important to us and we tried to also be accommodating towards the needs. So we had sometimes a format like an overhead where people could interfere or also give examples how they would feel that the display of the archive would be appropriate towards their own needs. And I just go quickly. So here we have um, also different objects. One is a um, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, letter from the GDR, which also had a very schizophrenic uh, halo about it, on one side being very um, supportive and in, uh, in solidarity with resistant movements on the African continent. And on this other side, there was this weird romantic idea of 
the extended territories of Germany. In the middle we have the Sarotti figure, which yesterday we uh, quickly discussed, that very similar to what the Julius Meindl pictogram um, was subject to various uh, criticism. And what they did was to kind of like whitewash and say, we acknowledge the inherent racism and we just change it. So they basically kept the silhouette and changed it to another figure which they said was a magician. Here, another uh, person who constantly inspires us, Arjuna Padurai. I'm not going to read the text. <laughs> um, I'm happy to share the slide afterwards as well. And just uh, to mention here, Arjun, since we have the Savi Contemporary uh, Doc, which is an open library, Bishan's Bibliothek, he donated us 4,000 of his books for people to also come and engage with the works. Um, as I mentioned, the archive needs to constantly be questioned, penetrated, reshaped. So one way uh, we try to do this is to invite thinkers, activists, um, school kids to interfere and activate and to be activated by the archive. Um, in this monumental debate, uh, the Bismarck status in the um, Berlin Zoo is a very, I would say, um, important uh, place of gathering because um, the tiring truth is we could stand there every day for the next 50 years and we would still have a lot of people opposing the idea that Bismarck was someone who was not only the father figure of Germany, but a very toxic entity in regards to initiating the Berlin Congo conference, etc., etc. So one of these attempts uh, is here a collaboration with the artist duo Varys and Gold, who approached us after a series of performances that we did at the Bismarck Status because they are artists who basically always form and take the, the mold of um, statues. Uh, here on the left side, we see the top. So basically we took advantage of a scaffold of people renovate, like the city of Berlin renovating the monument. And we took off the mold in a different shadow. So it was called Monumental Shadows because we said it's not good enough to just take the mold of a statue. What do you do then with the cast of Bismarck? And this was the first um, shadow to take off the mold of Bismarck, then descend and take this cask out and then uh, have a different intervention. The picture on the right is a performance at the Nettelbergplatz. So we always say the it's not an intervention if you stay within the safe realm of artists, activists, and all of you congratulate how beautiful your work is, but you need to, you know, bring the neighborhood, bring the people who are subject by the repercussions of this period of time. So we were here in Berlin Wedding on the Nettelbergplatz and had a whole afternoon where also children painted over the cast of um, Bismarck. So the aim of the project is to de- monumentalize these monuments by symbolically knocking them off the pedestals and charging them with new meanings. In the visual design of cover, we address the respective monument and its colonial history. Through the lightness and malleability of the paper, their transience becomes visible. Subsequent, subsequently, the resulting molds are performatively deformed in fair formances through which they become tangible. This shows history is not static and we're all part of it. Our concern is to break the power of this white omnipresent narrative on colonialism by proposing a change of perspective. In doing so, it's important to stop reproducing Eurocentric views and narratives. It is long overdue to bring more light and attention to the historiographies and narratives of people of color, which have often been silenced and ignored until now. A society critical of colonialism and racism can only emerge with their voices as integral part of a collective commemorative culture. So in its monumental shadows, rethinking colonial heritage, artistic exploration of Germany's colonial heritage, we uh, want to kind of like activate this culture of remembrance and also the many paths that we can't even imagine that people bring. And 
yeah, so this uh, project again to um, mention was initiated by the artist duo Varys and Gold, who approached us and we developed it together. And the last project I want to talk about is something that will open tonight in Berlin. So this is basically, um, these are very bad images because they were taken with a phone that just sent to me. This is a collaboration with the artist Henrike Naumann with the title Toxic Cultural Heritage Collection. The Toxic Cultural Heritage Collection um, gathers contemporary everyday objects and furnishings from flea markets, eBay, private homes that tell the story of Berlin's colonial past and racist present. These include, for example, racist stereotypical depictions of black people, for example, in the form of CD stands and ashtrays. Particularly worthy of mentioning here are forms of colonial style, ethnic looks and exoticism. So for this duration of the project, the objects from colonial neighbors will become part of the toxic cultural heritage collection. And they're basically tucked in into this um, furniture. And the most important part of this display format is that during the exhibition period, Berlin-based artists or activists or school classes whose practices deal with issues such as colonialism and racism will be invited to use the objects in the collection as a starting point for critical artistic engagement. A special focus will be on the question of representation and reproduction of toxic images, its display and framing, and non-exhibition. The spatial installation by artist Henrike Naumann provides the space and the first artistic contribution for this at Savi Contemporary. And I'm ending here and I just want to acknowledge that uh, all this work, luckily I don't have to do alone, but I want to also mention the many people that make this work possible. So, um, Bonaventure Sobeng Dikung, Arlette Luis Ndakose, Ono Chimen, Elena Quintarelli, Lema Sikot, Anna Jäger, Juan Pablo Garcia Sosa, Lili Somogi, Lia Milanesio, and the entire Savi team. And for Colonial Neighbors, special uh, thanks also to Antonio Mendes and Lema Sikot. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, of course, I feel um, very invited to, to oh, like, yeah, I feel invited by the invitation of Mina to take the opportunity to now think, start to think together the idea of the monument and its activation also through a, pl a place of um, looking at the archive. And there are many things that we could discuss and unpack from here. But, and I have also many questions, but I swallow them, I keep them, because I would really like to have a discussion with you online and in place. So maybe you have some questions and thoughts, and I give you more tem time than I, that I can bear, so I don't come in with my next question. I will be silent so that you can come up with something. Woo, there is someone. Just. Yeah. Yeah, congratulations to both of the presentations. Uh, amazing and fascinating content. I had a short question for the sp uh, speaker from Finland on the Lenin monument on the Lenin monument. I just wanted out of curiosity to ask you know, these pictures that you showed with the defacement of, let's say, vandalizing actions of the Lenin status in, in, in Finland. I was wondering if there's a specific content of the slogans, uh, like of the people like messing around with the monument. Like, is this, is there a, I don't know, 
neo-fascist or crypto-fascist content and so on. I'm just asking because, you know, in the, I don't want to make a comparative analysis, but on the Greek context, let's say, you know, there are various, you know, types of vandalization, you know, the Jewish monument Thessaloniki, which is, you know, openly from fascist or neo-fascist Nazi groups, but has another, you know, history and connotation. And with anti-fascist and or socialist monuments, also complex history because, you know, Greece had never a socialist regime. So I'm just, I'm not comparing, well, it seems that I'm comparing, but yeah, I just wanted to the content of the slogans and, uh, and a subject. Yeah, the, the, there's a film. There's something with the microphone. Okay, so a short suggestion after the question that maybe you have seen it that there's this uh, film from Thodoris Hagelopoulos, and there's a great scene of the defacement of a, of a Lenin statue, 95, the gaze of Ulysses. So yeah, perhaps we could you could see that in your research, this uh, long scene of a Lenin uh, statue defacement. If you look at filmic representations, but we can discuss that later. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, thank you for this question. I'm actually not sure. I have a vague memory that I might have seen this film, but uh, I'm not 100% sure. And uh, somehow I was maybe more engaged with this topic, yeah, like maybe almost 10 years ago. But um, yes, yeah, so. Uh, uh, yeah, you are right. In in Finland, often the the uh, the, the kind of uh, the vanda, vandalism uh, that these Lenin monuments are target of uh, are in the shape of drawn swastikas or or texts written. Yeah, like uh, uh, yeah, like could be written mass murderer and with blood and um, um, yeah uh, I would say that they are uh, yeah, uh, they are very much uh, done by the uh, neo-nazis uh, and yeah like that they are also then posting maybe videos uh, where they are <clears throat> like stealing a plate and then drilling on it and uh, yeah so um, but, but I would say that it is not only the neo-Nazis, but somehow there is a kind of silent approval by the whole kind of uh, most of the society to the destruction of these monuments and plates. Tumuahiba first. Uh, thank you both for your presentations. Um, this is a question for Linhan. Um, as somebody who works extensively with archives, I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit more on this idea of vulnerable ar archives, especially as um, I think there's an inherent, anytime you're working with archives, there's an inherent co-opting of voice. And I was just very curious as a team at Savvy, how you guys address this, not just about kind of bringing forward voices of the marginalized, but taking into consideration the institution um, that then becomes a part of that voice by presenting it. So where, um, you know, where are the conflicts um, and how do you deal with those conflicts when you're dealing with this idea of vulnerability? Thank you so much, Heber, for uh, mentioning this. And I think, um, as I mentioned already, luckily we're not a museum and we don't have to represent in a way that um, gives le legitimacy towards the project. So a lot of, because I was talking about absence, a lot of times things are hidden. So they're not there like, hey, we're doing this great work and blah, because we're not doing a great work until we're not really penetrating, you know, the stories behind these objects and bring to life the inherent fascism that we are surrounded by. And the word vulnerability also is very cynical in our approach because it's an underfunded project, there's no money. Because uh, the funding bodies mentioned, oh, it's a beautiful project, la la la, but it's not historically relevant. So it's still World War II, the Shoah, etc. rightfully, 
important, but it's not as, you know, it's not seen as a legitimate historical engagement. And um, therefore, a lot of funding bodies tell us, oh, it's nice, but, you know. And one of the um, things that make it also unfundable is that there is no end. So there's this gathering process where people donate their things. And it's a very, I would say the fragility stems also from the fact that people come and they need to open up towards their Uh, relation to these objects so people need to have the guts to say hey you know I'm ready okay I'm done. I'm okay with acknowledging the genocide World War II and in our family we see that there are connections also to annex territories and maybe shit we're accountable for something else and this process is a very um, I would say it's not so prominent not a lot of people donate and some people donate things and say i want to have nothing to do with this i don't want to be mentioned and this is also very important and the institute institutes institutionalization of things is a very important point because this is overshadowing things you know so i must say one thing of working in a precarious space because we constantly need to look for funding is also the beauty that you don't need to serve a certain politics of representation and you don't have to answer towards the funding bodies that um, need you to fulfill certain things. So I think as a precarious archive, there's a lot of problematics in the means how we can do things. But there's also the blessing that we don't have to do it in an institutionalized way. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, thank you very much for both um, um, four tracks. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, But my question I go to Mina Henriksen, and uh, because of uh, I'm very curious about this Lenin's history, and I know that it's still uh, between uh, Russia and Finland very, uh, I'd say, difficult. Uh, it's a good relationship in a level of states, but still uh, there is no this kind of German Aufarbeitung, also the the whole. Full, full of violence, history is still kind of not, um, not uh, how to say, researched, not uh, in discussion. And for example, to this story about Lenin's monuments in St. Petersburg, was a history about uh, manor game, uh, uh, tafel, kind of memorial desk, which was uh, uh, made uh, uh, from the idea of Russian um, uh, state uh, uh, bureaucrats who told that Manargim was kind of tsarist uh, <clears throat> um, yeah, military uh, general, and that's why we have to commemorate his uh, <clears throat> personality. It was also vandalized, uh, but from the side of uh, national Bolsheviks. It's also kind of a very uh, strange group, political group. So that, that was all, also a very controversial uh, situation with kind of manor game in St. Petersburg, Lenin and so, so on, and Ukraine also maybe for, for this. And for me, <clears throat> and I understand Lenin is a very controversial figure, so that's kind of From one side, he's a kind of father of the Soviet Union, and from other side, he's a also kind of this imperialistic uh, still uh, view on uh, other streets, former Soviet republics. And for me, my, my question <coughs> is, uh, <coughs> sorry, how you understand the figure of Lenin? Is it like, um, do, do we need to decolonize his monuments, or, uh, or it should be like in a, Um, because uh, there is also tradition to put monuments, uh, uh, I'll say memory, 
<laughs> Lenin statue in a park where it's kind of entertainment, or it, for example, like Lenin's mo mausoleum in Moscow, it's a, like an attraction for international guests who goes to, to see. Uh, it's a, thank you. It's a, it's a challenging question. Um, yeah, well, first of all, I would kind of, yeah, thank you for bringing Mannerheim into this as well. Uh, so for those who don't know, Mannerheim was uh, or still is the number one Finnish national hero. And uh, the main street in Helsinki is Mannerheim Street. And uh, in the very center of Helsinki, there is Mannerheim statue and uh, he was one of the presidents, early presidents of Finland, but also uh, the, the, the military leader uh, in the wars that have taken place in Finland. So, so in the Second World War, uh, when Finland uh, joined the forces with uh, Nazi Germans, uh, Mannerheim was the military leader. And also before that, in 1918, uh, in the Finnish civil war, which uh, was just a couple of months after the Finnish independency. So, uh, so he was the leader of the whites uh, who fought against the reds and, and won. And then uh, after the war, a lo lot of uh, reds were put into prison camps and kind of uh, slaughtered, revenged, um, yeah. Ex uh, yeah, executed and so on. Uh, so, so he is definitely not a simple figure. Um, uh, yes, and and Finland. Uh, my take on the. Yeah, yeah, uh, I do agree that. Yeah, and I, that's what I was trying to bring forward in this uh, my presentation was that, yeah, Lenin has all the, the statues of Lenin are product of certain different times and, and also uh, dismantling of them is a product of, of certain times and historical places and uh, events. Uh, and I personally don't think that it is very fruitful to, 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 to have uh, kind of Lenin, Lenin statues are very, very loaded, and instead, uh, if we want to uh, commemorate uh, leftist anti-fascist ideas, I, I would say that it is in the in the shape of a library and a workers' school, like the, the Marx Memorial Library. So, I don't think that a, a statue in itself can do much to, to, to manifest kind of egalitarian ideas that Lenin, for me, actually stands for in the end, because for many other people it stands for different things. The next comment or question is by Lee Hilscher. Thank you. Yeah, I have just uh, two uh, short questions, one for you, Mina, and one for you, Linem. The one uh, for Mina is like, uh, you stated like anti-fascist uh, monuments so clearly, and I would uh, would be interested what means anti-fascist monuments be, uh, for you, because um, as I know from my time in Eastern Europe, these are like, uh, it's always like a, it's a, a hero uh, monument. It's always like the big war of the fatherland. So it's not the war against fascism, for example. And there's also like this very strong um, masculinity there and serving women, for example. So, and I mean, anti-fascism for me is much more. It's about emancipation. And these are definitely not emancipatory monuments. So, and so I would, uh, would be interested also why you put it just so shortly, like anti-fascist monuments, so on. So what is your concept and your thinking uh, behind this? And um, yeah, the question for, question for Linem would be, um, 
maybe you can just comment on an observation I had in your talk is like there was like um, there's a lot of interaction how you draw it out so like the exhibition you mentioned there's like a space for interaction uh, um, for, for action and um, also like uh, working with Bismarck not destroying Bismarck or putting another monument there but working and creating spaces and so on and also in the archive I think there's also something about creating spaces and like there's nothing fixed and uh, is it maybe also the important thing you to just can't build another monument or you can't build another archive and fix it. It's more about the process and creating rooms of discussion and interactions. So, yeah. Yeah, can I, I, I will just respond briefly because I think that I kind of was trying to say that as response to the previous question that for me uh, a statue of a person, of a man, uh, it's not necessarily that that can convey, let's say, anti-fascism or leftist ideas, but it needs to be something else uh, than, than that. And yeah, like I, I would really think that a library or, or a school where it's possible to think together, that would be the, the place rather than a, a monument, like a bronze or granite monument. Uh, yeah, thank you. I think uh, it's very important to, like in this activation process, you know, we say we cannot have um, racist objects lying in a vitrine and this is the archive. So we don't want to create, you know, this um, drawers like pornography, science fiction, anti-colonial thingies. It's just a theme, so to say, you know, and then we want to come to this point where it's not only the audience or the people we invite, we ourselves want to be challenged and asked to interact in one way or the other or to also stand in opposition to something. Because, you know, it would be lazy to just gather an archive and to say, oh, I'm the curator of this archive, but in the end I would do nothing than to just allow people to donate things. So just putting things into practice is very important because, you know, if we think about decolonial, anti-colonial things, I mean, there's this uh, Buddha statue that was destroyed in Afghanistan that was built over 500 years, like a lot of, you know, centuries, a lot of families built it. And then people starting to excavate the Buddha statues, the families did not even see the feet but yet they knew they have to do it. And I, in my work, I also see this, like, we don't do shit just like this, you know? Like, we are building, you know, the beginning for people to, to be able, eventually, hopefully, to overcome things. You just don't uh, overthrow capitalism from one day or the other, you know, you need to start. So I think there's this need to constantly invite people to um, interact, to crush things and also that you yourself, you always challenge yourself, okay, with another artistic practice that I am not aware of or I'm constantly challenged as well. I think we need to put ourselves in this momentum of uncomf uh, uncomfortableness, is this a word? Well, we're uncomfortable. And so I think also the process of this um, conference is very important to have so many speakers building upon each other and sometimes then you're tired, you're you know, saturated. But how can we even claim to take, you know, the work seriously if we can't sit on a chair comfortably for eight hours dealing with NSU killings or this and this and that? And if we don't even put ourselves a bit in the place of uncomfortness, so I think it it lives from this interaction and constantly challenge. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Do you have more, more thoughts? Yeah. Um, yeah, I also have a question for Linham. Because um, I thought, yeah, it's very interesting how you facilitate uh, these objects and you can actually use it. And um, a, a friend of me and we are working also to cultic objects, but more from the um, NS uh, times. And there we had a talk with the um, professor called Frau Gänger and she said something about uh, the fetish and how 
um, militaria collectors want to really have and own the things and have the small objects and carry it around with them. And um, somehow it reminded me on flea markets, you can, uh, in a way, in a similar display also, buy these objects. Like, I guess you can also buy these Mohren Apotheken um, and various objects. And um, yeah, how do you uh, deal with that? And uh, do you, um, yeah, yeah, what do you think of this this fetish? Who addresses it in a way, or who is also like using it in the same way that you maybe, uh, yeah, share it with the public? Yeah, I will just answer briefly. So you're very right. You know, a lot of people they claim to be I don't know, open-minded, democratic law, and uh, and still there's this notion of you know romanticism towards like war trinkets or you know uh, antiquariat thingies and. It's quite fascinating how we deal in school about, you know, unlearning Second World War atrocities. And at the same time, you have war walks in the city and people are fascinated by war and terror. And so there's a weird halo around things that have a swastika. And I must say, I'm very sure a lot of people have things at home that they kind of like uncannily keep in drawers. And they. So one way to not feed this fetish, as you mentioned, is not to lay things out. So people cannot in a pervert way also relate to things because we, of course, this is a um, reality. So we're not only surrounded by people who want to dismantle and, uh, you know, like uh, burn patriarchy and this and this and that, but people who, who nurture um, nationalist ideas and have a fetish towards. I think it's a long way and it's not just by not showing things, it's not good enough, but through interventions and yeah and I must say I'm also I don't have the answer because it's a um, reality that we need to bring into the space because we live with people who have this and we need to find spaces where we just uh, question it like hey why do you have this romantic feeling about you know war trinkets yeah I feel that we, I can now come up with my questions. <laughs> or um, Actually, I don't have questions. I, many things were said and many things were put on the table. And as we sit here together now, maybe we can come to this, we can think together about these questions of, the, of possible futures. And unless maybe also see, I feel that we all agree that the memo, that like memo, the, the memorial or the monument is something that we want to think as a process, as an active process and as an intervention in the same time in obviously co existing continuities of histories of violence in the present. Some people mentioned it, and I would agree, um, also as a relation to a history of struggles against this history of violence. Um, if, we, if we want to see it as this, um, let's, uh, let's, I ask the two of you um, if, if we should, no, before I ask you, I, I think a bit more. I actually, I actually work with Iri Drogov on a project that is called The Unarchivable, and it somehow it relates to the Apadurai quote that you had um, in your presentation. But more than the Apadurai quote that, that in, a, in a strong way relates to what has been called unarchivable while it was just silenced and kept out. What Irit Rogov and I work on is the question of how to relate to the affectivities and the struggles that just cannot be put in the police order of the archive. Because the police order will always in somehow create a logic of silencing, but also because of course it does what Apadurai says. It just keeps out a lot of life, a lot of strength, a lot of struggle. And we are asking ourselves in what way, 
one can work with the archive and relate to this moment of the unarchivable, if this should not be what actually archival work is about, if this should not be the politics and the ethics of the archive, these moments of actualization. Um, and the beautiful thing with archives is that you, you believe you gather something, but something, you have something completely different inside as well. Because just as you cannot keep out people, you can kill people, but you cannot keep them out through, with borders. You cannot keep out the history from the archives. There will always be traces of violence and traces of survival. And this is, I, I think this is the strength, we can say the right, but also the burden of memory that Olo Ogibe was speaking about. And that we were speaking about here a lot also, uh, Leon mentioned it, yeah? So now, if this is what we agree we want to do, collectively, collaboratively work on my, maybe also multifaceted and, and conflictual actualizations of the history. What could be practices? Because Mina says, rather the archive than the monument. I'm actually not sure about it, because around monuments, there are many practices as well. So let's just share a bit um, potentials, possibilities, interventions that can go around this actualization. Maybe Mina? First and then, uh, yeah, I, I also actually think that it is important that uh, that they, they are also taking place physically. Like I showed this in Yashi, this uh, this uh, tramline making the curve in the place where once was an uh, anti-fascist monument. <clears throat> and uh, yes, you cannot just put it somewhere behind closed doors and uh, and accessible to those who know how to request the things, but, but they need to be there available. And yeah, archive, uh, yeah, and I'm, I've been here today talking about library and school rather than archive, but, but okay, archive is part of a library, I would say, but uh, yeah, uh, and of course, like who, who builds the archive, one can do it oneself as well. Like there are national archives, okay. but then there are also counter archives in a way. There are, yeah, mm -hmm. we all can build archives. So. I would uh, want to answer this uh, in a way also to mention something that uh, Heber has brought yesterday, because I think a very good example of something that is unarchivable and silenced and left out was the minefield that Heber mentioned yesterday. So I would argue that the minefield in itself is a memorial of power, something you know that is not archivable, it's something unarchivable and silenced and left out. And yesterday I was quite taken when I heard, you know, that also this absence of the humanizing of the indigenous people and then leaving them with this shit, you know, with something that is like s striping them from like being able to live on the land. And, uh, you know, when you talk about affectivity, the images that followed, you know, people like left like with uh, half limpses. And so this traces of survival in this memorial of power is absolutely like one of the examples that I would say. And on the other side, as you mentioned, like what could be counter archives and yesterday the artist as well um, uh, Million who uh, uh, has shared with me also something in regards to practices and recordings of survivors and so we need to think of uh, some memory or things that are um, worth it to to bring us into this uh, memorial state are maybe also soft things, you know, like photographs. And you mentioned, for example, the film could be monumental itself. And I was thinking also about uh, the book by Tina Kamp where she says, Image Matters, and the title is Archive Photo Photography and the African Diaspora in um, Europe. And it talks about images and things that are also rendered tangible. And I was I wanted to share with you something, just a short thing where she was talking about images of uh, black and people of color in the Nazi area and also people being 
displays and she mentioned uh, about the pictures uh, I'm gonna quote in this way they force a kind of reckoning with what Avery Gordon has provocatively described as a form of haunting where that which appears to be absent manifests nonetheless as a seething presence and his images represent the synecdotical form of absent present or present absence that confronts us with the social lives recorded in his images so kind of like how can we commemorate the absent bodies with also soft uh, yeah memorial erections that could come in a photography or a book or an essay or just the memory of dismembered bodies it would be relating to the ghosts. Yeah. And I feel as an ongoing practice that, I mean, it's, ne it's never ending also in, never ending also because you might encounter some claims, some needs that you would have not thought about before and that would just bring you to the next anti-fascist step that is to be done, like the renaming of streets. Knowing that you have been working with the Bismarck Monument um, in such an ongoing practice also, I also know that you had many experiences there that in somehow reminded me to what Edward Freudman also said when they were in front of the Luega Monument for weeks. Um, can you share some of the, of the experiences or moments that you had to go through when you were working with the Bismarck Monument in Berlin? Okay, maybe one thing that I want to mention, you know, it's a myth to think that people in Germany who are only above 60, 70 are uh, holding to the idea that Bismarck was this hero. Uh, I want to mention, I mean, there were many disturbing uh, moments there where people who just casually come by, you would think they're only tourists, but there are a lot of Germans who come to really stare at Bismarck and have this feeling of, okay, this is, this is my hero. And the crazy thing is that also young people, this is the example I want to bring, uh, very much indoctrinized. So there were two boys that were maybe 17, 18 going to school, telling my colleague, Sagal Farah, who has roots in Somalia, but who is fluent in German, they they were talking about you know extended territories and the narrative the berlin congo conference and they said no 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 it's not togo it's deutsch südwest africa and we really don't care about the new borders so they have this understanding of what the extension of germany is and it's nothing you know like there's this understanding that okay it's only the old people and we young people are on this no so this is just so important for me to see that in education people are not only not aware of you know um, history but very much um, I would say versed when it comes to anti you know like in opposition towards a very right-winged ideologic like yeah life <laughs> itself how they understand it So maybe I just give back to you before we close anything. Because if not, I would say that um, I have a very bad uh, thing to announce that we already knew before. <laughs> that it's now that, that um, obviously there is an ongoing fascist knowledge going on that, uh, it, that is worse to be fought, that is uh, totally alive and worked on and not one knowledge but many knowledges. That is um, that many people, young people, are able to take away letters from Lenny monuments, um, talk, just try to share and broaden their um, racist and neo-colonial um, beliefs, and that what we do is worth it. And with this, I, I think we can go to lunch and um, we, and take nine minutes more for this lunch time to speak between us about. Um, what, what we could share, what we could, could do, what our strategies could bring, and uh, meet again um, in the afternoon after the lunch break 
where Tanja Mancheno will bring these questions back again to Hamburg, which I think is also very important. So thanks for being with us on this weekend, and thank you for Mina and Lynn Han for, yeah, for presenting and for bringing it also to such an actual question and situation.
Sollen wir jetzt anfangen, oder? Sonst wären wir zu late, oder? Ja, das sind schon drei Minuten. Tanja, bist du fertig? Ja. You need more tin. Maybe some more people. Because we are on the stream, you know, so. Ich weiß nicht. Um fünf nach fangen wir an. Ja? Okay. How do I say this? Is this Dicor or is it D-A-I? with Tanja Mancheno and I'm really happy that you are here, Tanja. So we have been in contact quite a while, but we never managed to meet in person. I only heard a lot about you and your work. And so Tanja is based in Hamburg and she's working as a researcher at the Research Center for Hamburg's Postcolonial Legacy at the University of Hamburg, where she has also taught in the field of um, social sciences on post-colonial theory and decolonial de thought since 2009. Her, her research is focused on urban space and violence, co colonial history and the analysis of its local and transnational consequences from a feminist perspective from the global south. Currently, Tanja Manceno is a member of DICOR and of the German-American Working Group on Diversity, Equity and Inclusion. Her coming publication is an essay entitled Beyond Coloniality in World Heritage, Countermapping the Colo Colonial Amnesia in Parisian Landscapes. And I'm especially very excited about Tanya's lecture today because we will questioning the sound of monuments and I'm really looking forward to that. So please welcome Tanya. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Michaela, for this nice introduction and uh, Nora for the invitation. I am really honored to be part of this amazing conference, um, which I believe has managed to um, gather together a lot of energies which were already boiling in this city and just awaiting to get to know each other and um, yeah, get inspiration from one another and of course also to network. So um, I do want to mention this, not only um, to, to give you some flowers because of this event, uh, but also because I think it's important when we think about memory work, remembrance work, that we do not forget that it's always a collective work. Of course, that has been already mentioned in a couple of uh, presentations before me, but I do think that it's important, not, uh, uh, again, to highlight the fact that no um, critical work of memory can be an individual work, even though it um, may happen at the academia. So with that in mind, I do want to say that um, the output of my research has been also the inspiration of a lot of voices, bodies, places, movements and migrations, which are, of course, part of the city, but are still not that visible. And this implies, of course, not only the collectivities that we may create in our own generation, but those who came before us, and those will, who will come after us. So I do um, like to think about the uh, possibility that in 30 years, uh, 
new generations of Germans will be also gathering together and discussing if they want to call their city a post-migrant city and if that term fits them well. And these discussions have always been raising, right? We heard yesterday for, um, about this amazing presentation of um, Max um, Shaw. Uh, can you remember me? His Sholek, yes, uh, his last name. Uh, how, um, like, uh, the terms to address non-white people in Germany has, have been changed, and he told us that, for example, the concept of Muslim was just invented a couple of years ago. I would say it has been reinvented, and we are dealing always with, with new concepts to discuss the difference um, and uh, which, difference, which differences are being addressed. And I think that um, after two days of amazing um, presentations and to see that uh, we are working together from different backgrounds um, towards pretty much a similar or at least um, comparable, a comparable um, goal, so to speak, at I, I believe that we all try to think a social, uh, the public space in a way that it becomes much more pluralistic, much more inclusive, much more um, that it mirrors. How do we create a public space that mirrors or already the belongings which, which exist in this city? And this is um, a little bit what I do. And um, I have brought you a little bit of um, photographs also to um, recall the energies were, which were already there, um, which uh, are dealing with this discussions of thinking the public space of, and of course monuments um, from a much more transnational perspective. And I will um, explain a little bit what I mean by that with some examples. And let me start with the most salient one in the, con in, in the context of a German um, history and um, critical social present. And this is um, the genocide uh, in Namibia. We have heard about this a couple of times already in this conference. As you know, as you probably know, the genocide has been accepted as one um, just this year after 100 hundred years of resistance from the communities uh, that uh, in Namibia, Herero Onam are still, and Danma are still facing the consequences of colonialism. So they were here in 2018 and um, um, did a sort of demonstra uh, manifestation towards the Hafen city, the new um, neighborhood of this city in which much more of the colonial nostalgia and colonial amnesia, as uh, Jürgen Zimmer would say, is to be displaced. And you see here also the delegates from the Herero Onama who were reclaiming um, an acknowledgement of the genocide. So even though if um, the genocide has been accepted as one here in Germany, we still do not have a moment, um, as, um, for example, uh, a minute of silence. And I do think that that's problematic that we do not link um, the uh, recognition of a crime with uh, ritualistic practices of mourning. That says something about uh, the lack of affect in um, the cognitive acceptance of the genocide. We also see that, of course, um, Black Lives Matters had the protest also um, being imported or translated here. But one year before, we had our own history of a um, black human being who was killed by security guards in uh, the um, hospital of the university. Um, yes, so as you see, he's been um, fortunately remembered now with um, already a, um, an article in Wikipedia, but that's also part of the communities which have uh, reclaimed the, um, the crime that happened there and also the recognition of a, of, of, of a student who died in, in the hands of the um, security guards. And it doesn't... Uh, end up that there. Um, also, the whole um, Road Must Fall movement had also an impact in Hamburg in the last years. And as you see, also um, the um, historical criminals have been, um, had been confronted with 
the whole history, or at least with a, a more complete history. And we see here some of the statues which cannot be teared down. You cannot tear down a two meters Columbus statue, a statue um, of, of a stone. It's just not possible. So um, what, what to do with them which cannot be uh, teared down? And this is one of the creative initiatives and unfortunately, I didn't have to do anything without, but, but with it. But I think it's um, amazing that uh, people realize, okay, what do we do with statues that cannot be um, banished, that cannot be uh, teared down from the public space? And I recall you all these actions, these appropriations of the public space in Hamburg, not only because, of course, it's part of the local history um, that I make part of, but also because I think it's important not only to remember that uh, memory work is collective, but also that it's always been, in a way, in, inspired by uh, movements from the global south. So just as Nora mentioned in the beginning of our Congress, um, with a reference to Road Must Fall, um, we should keep in mind that when we engage in the global north uh, in practices of rethinking the public space in a much more pluralistic manner, it's mostly coming from the south. And it's mostly coming from initiatives with which think already history much more beyond the national borders. That's why it was possible to link the protest in Cape Town in 2016 to the colonial amnesia in Oxford, which was afterwards translated to Oxford. So let's remember that the impulse are coming from the global south, from Cape Town, and then went to Oxford, and perhaps from there to here. And we can also make that kind of connections, of course, I just as mentioned, not only with Namibia, because if the genocide is being accepted here, it's because 100 years people in Namibia have been reclaiming such an acknowledgement, but also because, um, what did I want to say? <laughs> um, so yes, so um, yes, sorry, um, of course. Uh, you, we could also go a little bit, um, not that far away in history, in 100 years, 50 years, um, we can also see how um, the um, Aufarbeitung, so the memory work in Chile and Argentina with the dictatorships there, motivated um, an Aufarbeitung, um, a, a critical work of the uh, dic uh, dictatorships in uh, Spain, for example. That's also a fact. So. Let's keep that in mind, that the impulses of rethinking um, our public space and monuments are mostly coming from the South. So yes, with this really um, long introduction, I will talk to you a little bit about my work. I have uh, brought you two or, or three um, examples about uh, of the um, the soundscapes that I create, of course, with many other um, people who are active in this city. And Let's just listen to one of them before I um, keep on talking that much. Um, interesting enough, uh, you, you will see the relationships, the links uh, that are being established also in this conference because the person who, had, who, who I interviewed um, and opened the, the series of interview, what, that, what Does Hamburg Mean to You?, is actually um, the artist Oyunto Yin Miley Spain, who has renamed herself since then, and you can also see her latest clip behind in one of the screens which are being also um, curated as part of this conference. So let's hear and learn a little bit more about um, Oyunto in Meli, Spain. I have to close a little bit the presentation. My name is Latoya Mendy Spain from Sierra Leone, Nigeria. I'm a musician, an activist. I work with different migrant communities. That's basically what I do. How long have you been living in Hamburg, Latoya? I've been in Hamburg now since, permanently since 1994. I was here in 86 to 87 as an exchange student, but since 1994 I'm permanently here. 
Would you like to tell me what do you relate with the city, Hamburg? Do you have any associations when you think about Hamburg which come up in your mind? With Hamburg at the moment, I would say I relate diversity to it. I relate it to a place where, with a lot of potential, I see it as a city which is still being developed and created, and I see that I have a role to play in this direction. Wonderful. And what about the slogan that the city has, Tor zu Welt? Would you tell me one or two sentences about that slogan? What does it do with you? I can say, like, when I came to Hamburg in 1996, the gate to the world, of course, sounds very inviting. But at the time, I realized that this gate is not open to everybody. It's very open to goods, products, resources, But when it comes to people, it's very discriminatory. Now we'll go back to the city, and I would like to ask you, where do you think that remembrance mm -hmm. is gathered in the city? Where can we keep remembrance? Remembrance, I think, is everywhere. Remembrance is everywhere. But if you're talking of, from a white perspective, from the Eurocentric perspective of manipulating resemblance and creating structures and memoria in order to retell history in a way which makes some people appear better, <laughs> more powerful, more intelligent, more successful, then I would say, yes, it is. this type of remembrance is concentrated on certain areas. But um, like I said, Hamburg is for me an open city with different people, and we all have this obligation to remember. And remembering for me is not only in places, but our minds, our bodies, education. Yeah, it's a very big word. I don't know if we can really... <laughs> But you already give me two aspects which I like to find out a little bit more. When you say about the remembrance from an from the official point of view, where do you think about this kind of information with which we are always confronted with? I mean, can you tell me one place in Hamburg when you always see this same story being told over and over, over and again? Over and over again. It could be, for example, like if you look at the Hafen city and mm -hmm. you walk through it and mm -hmm. you see these buildings of power, of affluence, you know, status symbols. I mean, sometimes you see buildings and colonial is written there like a big title, which one should be proud of. So the bodies remember as well, and there were also some bodies which we were trying to think about the colonial history of the city. You have probably heard about the Snats Papier and so on. Maybe you can tell me a little bit what about, where do you see, you said already that there are some places in which colonial is a prestige word to be proud of. Can you tell me other places in Hamburg in which this colonial legacy is so present that you always are a little, you don't feel comfortable there or something? Is there mm. a place, a special place for you in Hamburg? There are two places I can think of. One everyday place, for example, are street names, you know, like uh, there was a big fight, Schimmelmannstrasse, things, some names like this. but. Not everybody maybe knows the history of these names, but like a particular place I can mention is the museum, Museum for Volkerkunde. This is for me like expresses it totally. And we talk of post-colonial, but the question is you cannot talk of post-colonial while colonialism hasn't ended. Do you think that there's a way that we could rethink this place, the Volkerkunde Museum? Do you see a way out of the colonial gaze there? There probably is the way out. By being honest, we cannot rewrite history. But if we go from the point that colon we have to talk about, we cannot disconnect decolonization from colonialism, from imperialism. There's a connect. And the people who have these histories, one has to have them involved. It's not possible to also take over the post-colonization or the decolonization process. The first step for me would be 
putting the decolonization process in the hands of those who have suffered most from colonialism. And do you know somewhere in Hamburg or somewhere else where the power relationships have been put aside in a way where we are able to manage decolonial spaces? Have you had that impression in Hamburg or somewhere else in the world? In Hamburg, I can't really speak of a specific place. I would have to think a bit more about that. I can't really name a particular okay. place okay. at the moment. Okay, don't worry. Just to close up, maybe, can you tell me a little bit more about remembrance on the body? Do you think that it is possible to put non-white bodies on the public sphere? What would be the strategies to make visible other kinds of memories through the body? Mm -hmm. Make invisible cannot come from the other. And also, I think, realizing that Things have changed. I mean, Hamburg is an open society, and Germans are no longer just white. So I think if we have an honest way of display, a truly inclusive way of displaying, I think it happens naturally. So for me, the problem is basically the political struggle, which is ongoing, and um, these are just symptoms of a bigger issue, which we are all still trying to deal with. And what, what would be that issue? The issue of inequality, the issue of imperialist exploitation, which still goes on. This whole imbalance mm -hmm. is still the issue. And I think honesty would be the first doubt. Honesty in the educational system, what we teach the children, how we narrate history in the books, that would be for me like the first step. And in the Ghanaian community tradition, there's a saying from the Akan, Sankofa mm -hmm. people, and it's a symbol with like a bird, and it has its head looking back. And it says like Sankofa, you have to look back, in other words, to move forward. And I think, yeah, that would be like really the first step in simply relating the past honestly from the perspectives of everyone, that would be a first start. I think when one can really relate the past in an honest way, there is already a lot to be learned. Thank you very much. Lataya. You're welcome. Okay, yeah, I saw that the time is going really fast and I'm not sure I will be able to show you much more, but so let's let's go a little farther. I, I, I will play another one, which is also, um, an amazing interview I had the opportunity to do with uh, the historian uh, from Evinhook, Memory Viva, and it's just fascinating that her name is really Memory. And um, yes, unfortunately, you are not able to hear this interview. This is also kind of interesting how I can tell you a lot of um, histories that um, have... Um, enabled that the soundscapes become much more um, known also within the university. But let's hear a little bit now from, not only from the diasporic perspective of La Toya, um, um, mainly Spain, but also from um, Memory Viva and Windhoek. Thank you for your talk. In your talk, um, Memory Viva, you mentioned that um, many places have changed name in Namibia. Can you tell me a little bit more about those public spaces which have renamed themselves? Who were the one behind the initiative and who took the decision? Mm. So, um, if you're talking about name changes, I can talk about the city that I'm from. I'm from Vintuk, I was born in Vintuk. And uh, some of the name changes that have happened in Vintuk have been the initiative of the city of Vintuk, so the municipality. And the municipality obviously is under the government. So the government has made um, the initiative to change the names of previously colonial um, people, uh, names, street names or buildings or sites that were named after colonial people that were there that colonized Namibia. Um, so, for example, 
um, Kaiserstrasse, which is this, the main street in the city center, has been changed. The name was changed to Independence Avenue, and other names in the city were changed to um, uh, Liberation Struggle Heroes, um, either from the continent, Robert Mugabe, or from places like Cuba, Fidel Castro, and yeah. So other names have changed in that way. And um, I think this is important because if you if you think about the kinds of meanings there are in land and spaces, you know, it's not just about a, a name of the changing of a name. It's not as simple as that. It's about um, the kinds of things that happen in those particular spaces and the ways in which people would try to change symbolically and physically what happened in those spaces. And so that's what it is about, you know. So the, that's how deep the meanings of meaning of changing a name is, because in in land we imbue um, thoughts about um, our land carries our memories, it carries our people's bodies, it carries all of these symbolic meanings and all of these physical things. And so that's why a name, a changing changing of a name, is important. It is wonderful to hear, okay, from uh, Kaiserstrasse to Independence Street. How do you think that people feel when they walk through a Independence Street instead of a Kaiserstrasse? Namibia, Deutsch, Südwestafrika. Namibia, Deutschafrika. 1884 bis 1919. Namibia, deutsches Schutzgebiet. Schutzgebiet mit Schutztruppen. Doch wer schützt hier wen? Vor was? Yes, um, so unfortunately the, the, the time is run off, uh, so I will not be able to talk to you or to present you a little bit um, about the last landscape I wanted to show you about the museum, which has been already mentioned, the ethnological mu museum, which changed the name. Um, yes, perhaps we can discuss it a little bit more in the um, in, in the question um, session, but now I do have to leave the floor. Thank you very much. You are now you are muted. currently the only person in this conference. You are now unmuted. Machen. Hallo. <lacht> Hörst du uns, Stefan? Hörst du uns eigentlich an? Hm? Ähm, Sieht nicht so aus. Ohne Audio verbunden. Okay. Ja, sehr schön. Okay.
Ach, Sie können uns also nicht hören. Doch, ja? Wir können Sie aber nicht hören. Vielleicht machen Sie einmal das Mikrofon an kurz. Kann, kannst du dein Mikrofon unten anschalten? Ja, jetzt mit Wunderbar. Das Platten, ne? Okay. Genau, dann funktioniert es auch. Super. Super. Dann machen wir einmal so. Das so, hallo Stefan. Schön, dass das klappt. Ähm, so. I will give a little introduction to our next speaker. It's uh, Stefan Trübi, who is uh, on the screen from Stuttgart, I believe. You're in Stuttgart? Okay. <laughs> so, uh, Stefan Trübi is professor of architecture and cultural theory and director of the Institute for Principles of Modern Architecture and Design at the University of Stuttgart. He was previously uh, professor of temporary architecture at the Hochschule für Gestaltung Karlsruhe. Um, before that, he was uh, head of the postgraduate program uh, Scenography Special Design at Zurich University of the Arts. Or later, that was later, sorry. <laughs> and then, uh, before he came to Stuttgart, he taught architectural theory at Harvard University and he was a professor at the Technische Universität Munich when we met for another project. So I'm happy you are here now, and I just will tell a little bit uh, about your publications you made. Uh, so just to name a few, there's Exit Architecture, Design Between War and Peace from 2008, and then uh, that, um, the German contributions to the Venice Architecture Biennial since 1991 on oral history, with Verena Hartbaum, 2016, and the history of the corridor, 2018. And the last one, maybe it's not the last one, but that's the reason that we invited you, is the publication Rechte Räume, Politische Essays und Gespräche, Right-Wing Spaces, Political Essays and Conversations. And um, we are really looking forward uh, to hear that now. So please, Stefan, very welcome. Thank you very much, Michael Emilian. And one second, I. We're now muted. Thank you very much, Michael Emilian and Nora Sternfeld, for the invitation. And uh, I'm really very sorry not to be with you today, but we still have unvaccinated children. So I try to avoid too much travel. Um, yeah, I would like to uh, share sc my screen with you. One second. You should see now my screen. Is that right? Is it okay? Do you see the screen? Okay, I hope you can understand me. Right wing spaces is my topic. And uh, before I um, try to uh, tell you a bit more about uh, some genres uh, I try to identify, um, let me uh, um, uh, allow me to say a few introductory words about the relationship of architecture and ideology. Um, there's probably no better place uh, in the world to talk about this link between architecture and ideology than this place here. We are seeing here a cathedral in Moscow, the cathedral of um, um, the, um, uh, uh, the famous cathedral next to the Kreml, which got constructed in the 1830s. And 100 years later, it got destroyed by Stalin in order to uh, build a new building, which was the Palace of the Soviets. Um, and this palace was under construction already in the 1930s. Then the Second World War came along and uh, the construction stopped. But at least the, the basements were um, uh, constructed already. Um, and yeah, what happened after the Second World War, the basements were not destroyed again, but they were filled with water, basically. The basements for the Palace of Soviets were uh, turned into a public pool where you could swim in um, uh, until the uh, early 1990s. Then um, something interesting happened. Uh, uh, the pool got destroyed again. 
Cathedral of Christ the Savior got reconstructed, uh, a building that uh, some of you might know, at least uh, via, via the news. Um, you probably all have heard of uh, the one or the other Pussy Riot action, which took place also in this building here. So there is obviously a relationship between architecture and ideology, but uh, what does that, what does it mean for um, talking about style, about architectural styles? Um, what I would like to avoid is to, to establish two superficial links between architecture and ideology by talking, for example, by columns or uh, colossal orders like you see here. You see here um, a building which got constructed in the political context of democracy. What we see here is the um, Parliament of Finland built in the 1930s. And if you close your eyes now for a few seconds and open it now again, then you see basically a similar building with the same elements, colossal auras, et cetera, et cetera. But it's, um, uh, it's a pseudo parliament in North Korea, the Manzu Day Assembly Hall in Pyongyang, constructed in, the, in 1984. And uh, not only in the wide field of classical architecture, but also in the field of, um, yeah, let's say modern architecture, it's not easy to establish uh, superficial links between architecture and ideology. You see here one of the masterpieces of modern architecture, but it's also, as you might know, um, uh, the Casa de Fascia, the house for the fascists in uh, Como in Italy, built for Mussolini, who also said um, uh, the material glass is a symbol for fascism because you can see through everything and also everybody. Uh, and this building had a highly interesting history of reception, uh, especially in the field of uh, architects like Peter Eisenman, who are, of course, uh, far from being fascist or even have sympathies for fascism. Uh, the, the contrary um, uh, is the case. But uh, um, especially uh, Tehrani's architecture uh, is um, is an example where where a kind of process of depolitization took place in order to uh, turn uh, this architecture and the elements of this architecture into a discourse about the autonomy of architecture. Um, and yeah, if you um, take the train between Stuttgart and Karlsruhe and open your eyes uh, in Pforzheim, then you see this building here, an apartment house, not inhabited by fascists, not built by fascists, but by Freifogel and Meyer architects. And of course, the illusion is very clear. It's again the Casa del Fascio by Terrani. Um, here, um, yeah, a collage uh, from the time um, of the completion in the 1930s. What I would like to say with this sequence of pictures there is no right-wing architecture, but there are right-wing spaces. We have to talk about, we, ha we have less to talk about materials, um, um, symmetries, columns, architectural elements, but we have to speak about actions, about uh, theory, about discourse, about documents, about letters, and about posts. Um, Two years ago, more or less two years ago, I published with my institute this and I guess edited this, this Arsch Plus issue on Rechte Räume, right-wing spaces in Europe and beyond, which uh, this issue caused a big debate, in, especially in Germany, uh, about the relationship of architecture and politics. Uh, and just to uh, say a few words about the structure of this issue, it uh, is basically a um, um, uh, a report of a journey that w we we undertook uh, in 2018, which led us from Rome to Berlin within one week. And within that week, we tried to identify, first of all, the um, built relics of um, fascism and notion, national socialism, but we also tried to identify potential continuities, um, uh, etc. And of course, uh, the 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 magazine issue was based on the polarity Italy and similarity also of uh, Italy and Germany on the one hand, but we also wanted to uh, talk about other European uh, and sometimes also, also non-European countries like Greece, Spain and uh, other uh, countries. The 
the places that we visited and analyzed was, for example, the starting point of the journey was the Casa Pound, um, um, a building from uh, the 1930s and uh, uh, in use by a neo-fascist movement, which later became a, a, a party, a political party called Casa Pound, a political movement that named itself after the uh, American poet and um, uh, yeah, fascist uh, Ezra Pound. Uh, another place that we visited was, for example, Predapio, the, the place where Mussolini was born and where uh, tourism, uh, dark tourism is, um, uh, uh, yeah, is underway until basically today. We also visited, for example, the the uh, political headquarter of the Lega Party, which used to be called Lega Nord Party, and uh, also the birthplace of uh, Adolf Hitler in Braunau am Inn was um, um, uh, was a place that we visited, and also, for example, the Kiffhäuser Denkmal um, in uh, Germany. Uh, we also tried to talk about uh, new settlements for neo-Nazis and uh, right-wing extremists um, in rural, in the rural countryside of Germany. And that's a topic I will uh, speak in a minute about uh, in, in a bit more detail. And after the, the trip ended in Berlin, uh, and again with the name Ezra Pound, because uh, in Berlin there, um, there's a square, a public square called Walter Benjamin Platz, uh, built, um, uh, completed in, t in the in the year 2000 by the Berlin-based architect Hans Koloff. And um, the architect, uh, that's, that's how this place, the square looks like. You see on the right and left the two new buildings by Hans Koloff, inspired uh, by um, uh, a few architectural examples stemming from it, um, Italian fascism and, um, and in the middle uh, of this public square, um was uh, uh, was a yeah were a few words cut in stone and um, i read it in german bei usura hat keiner ein haus von gutem werkstein die quadern wohlbehauen fugenrecht dass die stirnfläche sich zum muster gliedert that's a sequence uh, from Ezra Pound um, uh, uh, most important uh, uh, work the cantos and it's basically a, a, a very short message where uh, Ezra Pound says that um, uh, with um, uh, with uh, with Jews uh, you you can't build good architecture uh, and um, uh, Ezra Pound used a code word uh, for, for for Jews, uh, which was usura in German, uh, wucher. And uh, that's a topic we try to address also in public together with our friend, uh, the architect Markus Miesen. We uh, developed a um, we developed a poster campaign um, uh, which looked like that here on the right hand side. You you see the poster that we that we produced together with Markus Miesen and um, and we we covered uh, half of Berlin with this poster as you can see here where we try to establish kind of the the hidden links between uh, protagonists in history and uh, presence and um, and then the magazine came out and uh, the reception was very heavy in, in Germany. Uh, the kind of the liberal press was uh, deeply shocked about uh, uh, some of uh, what we've written and also defended basically the, the Esther Pound quote on a, on a public square dedicated to Walter Benjamin, the Süddeutsche Zeitung, but also the FAZ, the Frankfurter Allgemeine. Uh, the, the, the leftist press uh, not really wrote about this whole topic and uh, for to our surprise the uh, the conservative press uh, represented by die welt springer press in germany uh, turned out to be our <laughs> uh, supporter in this uh, issue at least and um, uh, uh, one journalist uh, wrote about uh, this issue and uh, uh, also named the owner of the square which is blackstone um, and uh, from one day to the next, the the, po uh, the poem, uh, the, the fragment of this poem disappeared 
overnight. Um, I hope you can see uh, this video here. And um, yeah, you see here suddenly the um, was gone. Um, at this point, I would like to present you a small um, uh, overview of what we try to identify as right-wing spaces in Germany, but also beyond Germany. I brought a couple of um, examples with me, um, and basically it's a, it's a kind of, I, I'm very hesitant with the word anthropology, but, um, but maybe we, we are about to identify certain patterns that um, are appearing and reappearing um, everywhere where we try to find right-wing tendencies in politics and also space. And I would like to start with the lonesome house, with the idea of a lonesome house of a right-wing protagonist, um, uh, which uh, is, is not somebody who is uh, um, who tries to um, uh, hide himself in the forest, but uh, somebody who tries to gain a territory in space. The lonesome house as a as a starting point for a process of territorialization, and you could start maybe with uh, the house of the um, contemporary uh, poet uh, Boto Strauss, close to Berlin. Here, uh, it's um, he's a conservative uh, poet with right wing. Uh, radical right-wing tendencies, and uh, there, there was a, a Spiegel essay he published in 2015, where he, where Boto Strauss wrote, "I would rather live in a dying but vital nation," he used the word "folk," than in one that is being rejuvenated by being mixed together with foreign peoples, primarily on the basis of economic and demographic speculation. End of quote. That's um, his place, and but we could also uh, talk a, a lot about uh, um, uh, houses, for example, of NPD politicians, neo-Nazi politicians like Udo Pasteur's here in Mecklenburg, uh, where um, it's a private residence on the one hand, but it's also a kind of backdrop of um, of a, a neo-Nazi YouTube channel called Deutsche Stimme. TV. We could also speak of the farmhouse of Jörg Haider, the Austrian right-wing politician, and uh, and and others. Uh, and the next step after the lonesome house is the settlement, the settlement to counter the death of the folk. You could say the Amadeo Antonio Stiftung uh, produced a lot of uh, very important research on this topic already. Um, uh, villages uh, in not only in East Germany, I have to stress, uh, like Jamal, um, uh, are here to mention uh, uh, in some documentaries. Uh, you can even find in these places uh, 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 grills uh, with a um, yeah with a lattice happy Holocaust, and um, uh, you see in these settlements uh, that um, that it's it's always about community. It's not about society, but about community, about a ethnic homogeneity uh, of a community and uh, these are processes that are not only underway in Germany but also in France there's a, for example a, um, a kind of female pop group um, uh, very well known called Elie Brigeant they produce um, songs uh, dedicated to uh, Jean-Marie Le Pen and others and uh, also produced songs with titles like France Notre Terre. Um, and they live in a, in a kind of hippie community in, in, the, in, in the countryside of France. Uh, and also in Hungary, we can identify this idea of a kind of, uh, of, a, of a rural settlement based on the idea of ethnic homogeneity and uh, um, xenophobic behavior. Uh, a couple of years ago, there was a, a mayor in a Hungarian village called Erpatak, called Oros. He um, established a really um, um, a terrible local regime where the children in the local kindergartens had to sing children's songs where they basically had to sing uh, uh, how it feels when they um, dance on their own future coffins. And uh, in this uh, little village of uh, Hungary, there were even uh, symbolic trial against Benjamin Netanyahu. It's a clearly anti-Semitic um, 
behavior. Uh, there's no reason to criticize. Uh, there are probably many reasons to criticize Benjamin Netanyahu, but not in a Hungarian uh, village. Um, yeah, here in you see uh, also uh, the consequences of this behavior, kind of uh, um, clothes, etc. And uh, you could also mention many American settlements of Ku Klux Klan uh, groups and uh, uh, Aryan nation groups. And that's uh, sometimes how they how they call them, um, where you can sometimes even identify interesting but also terrifying hybrids between churches and camps. Uh, the reason behind that is that at some point right-wing extremist groups in the United States discovered that they don't have to pay taxes when they call themselves churches. And that's uh, the point where they established uh, 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 bell towers uh, as church symbols uh, in front of their camps and uh, settlements. Um, and the next step after the Lonesome House, the settlement, is um, our historical places uh, that are appropriated to, to offer a community, a kind of folkish communities uh, with the help of castles and stately homes. And especially parts of the uh, history of right-wing extremism in Germany can be called, uh, can be tell, told with um, with castles. For example, the Wehrsport Kruppe Hoffmann, a, a, a kind of militia, private ne militia group around the neo-Nazi um, Hoffmann, um, uh, they they lived in um, many castles in uh, around Nuremberg, Schloss Almershof, Schloss Ermreuth, that's a place where uh, Karl-Heinz Hoffmann still lives today, and uh, other castles. But also the fact that one of the most important right-wing publisher, uh, Götz Kubitschek and um, his wife Ellen Kositza, uh, live in a, in a kind of uh, place that they call Rittergut, and which is a Rittergut actually, uh, is of course not a surprise. Uh, it's um, right-wing extremists in Germany have this uh, symbol of hate called 17 89, the French Revolution, and they have this soft spot for um, for uh, um, aristocratic and feudal orders with natural, so-called natural uh, orders of societies and also generals, of course. Um, also in France, we can identify uh, this certain sympathy of right-wing extremists uh, for uh, castles. I really have to stress I don't have anything against castles, but uh, I would like to understand the pattern of uh, this preference uh, better. Um, for example, um, um, Renaud Camus, the author of um, the Le Grand uh, Remplacement, the Great Replacement, um, lives uh, in an old medieval castle in France. And um, this uh, yeah, word, uh, this, this saying of the, this, um, this quote, uh, or the title, The Great Replacement, was also used by the, um, by the um, uh, terrorist, uh, Brenton Tarrant, for his uh, terrible attack in New Zealand. Um, and he used this, um, this, uh, this symbol of the so-called Black Sun on his own manifesto, which is a symbol um, that, um, that got established in, a, in an old um, uh, uh, yeah, castle in Germany called the Wiebelsburg. And this old castle was transformed during National Socialism into a kind of um, order for SS uh, members. And uh, in uh, in the center of, of this round tower that you can see here at the Webersburg, you can find this black sound, which is which turned into um, into a kind of alternative swastika symbol because the swastika is forbidden, at least in Germany, as a political symbol. Um, until now, I have only spoken about uh, rural areas, about castles, settlements, lonesome houses, etc. But the key issue um, is really uh, are the downtown areas where, where monuments to an alternative history of a country in Germany and beyond can be told. Uh, I mentioned already the Casa 
Pound, uh, which is a political movement, uh, and in contrast to many examples of right-wing extremism in Germany, uh, the right-wing, the, the neo-fascist movement in Italy was always a very urban movement. So um, all right-wing extremists look with a lot of envy to uh, to Italy, where they uh, try to learn from the Casa Pound. Uh, they try to learn from their their kind of parallel world with the headquarter, political headquarter, with apartments, but also with neo-fascist bookstores, fashion stores, bars, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, and um, in my writings on uh, uh, right-wing extremism uh, and radicalism in, in Germany and beyond, uh, I've I identified uh, uh, this certain preference of uh, um, right-wing. Um, uh, uh, radical uh, protagonists for um, the topic of reconstruction. Uh, the first initiative for the possible reconstruction of the Garnisonkirche in Potsdam stems from a right-wing extremist and uh, this reconstruction is um, on its way. The, the, the tower is more uh, almost completed and there's a still a debate about if the rest of the church gets reconstructed or not and um, yeah uh, uh, not only right wing and conservative political parties but also the SPD and the green party is in favor of um, um, of uh, certain reconstruction pro projects also this and um, uh, but uh, uh, right wing, uh, uh, radical right wing parties like the AfD are, of course, most happy about this development. A similar case I identified in Frankfurt, uh, where the first political initiative for the reconstruction of the new Frankfurt Old Town also stemmed from the right wing, um, uh, from a right wing political party or initiative. And um, the Humboldt Forum is uh, under attack since uh, its beginning, but uh, also since its completion uh, uh, this year. Uh, there are many, many discussions about uh, the motivations of uh, many people who gave a lot of money for for uh, the reconstruction of facade elements, etc. And again, here the AfD, the um, uh, the right wing, the radical right wing party in Germany, is in favor, of course, of uh, first of all the reconstruction. But they also would like to reconstruct the um, the former old town uh, of Berlin around the Humboldt Forum, and this. Uh, goes hand in hand with uh, comments about the quote ugly aesthetics. Uh, um, that's at least how Andre Poggenburg, a um, um, uh, radical right wing politician uh, in Germany, uh, called the Holocaust Memorial in, in Berlin. And he also said, quote, you could put something else there that would take up less space and have far more atmos atmosphere, end of quote. Yes, uh, I would like to conclude my pr little presentation um, and would like to mention that uh, we try to um, make more people uh, sensible um, for uh, these developments and uh, we established this tool of Rechte uh, Räume walks, right-wing spaces, walks, uh, w which we could uh, realize already with um, institutions in Munich, like Haus der Kunst or the Kammerspiele, but also in Frankfurt, uh, together with the Kunstlerhaus Musotum, and most recently in Berlin with the Gorky Theater. I would like to uh, stress this also, not uh, not to advertise uh, the, 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 um, the presentation of our right-wing Atlas launch uh, uh, um, in one week at the Maxim Gorky Theater in Berlin. But I would like to mention this also because um, we are pursuing this research uh, with institutions from the theater world and the art world, but never with uh, institutions from the architectural world. Um, even uh, even though we would like to do that, uh, there is no interest at all, uh, at least in our observation, to uh, cooperate uh, um, with us in, on this topic and also to deal with these issues. And maybe the reason behind th uh, this has something to do with a quote that David Ajay um, uh, mentioned in an interview uh, uh, a bit more than a year ago, architecture is the last industry to recognize the issue of white privilege. Thank you very much.
for your interest. You are now unmuted. I just was uh, in the internet with my sound. So thank you, Stefan. And I think we should immediately go on to our last speaker, to Klaas Gefroy from Hamburg. And uh, so he is addressing another topic in architecture. And afterwards, if you please stay with us, um, we can have a round together. That would be nice. So thank you so much. You are now muted. You are currently the only person in this conference. So let's continue and I'm happy that you all are still here so thank you very much and uh, now we are going again to Hamburg and I'm very happy that Klaas Githroy made it to us because he was in the beginning of the week he was uh, ill so but now he's here uh, here <laughs> thank you very much and uh, I, I just give a little uh, introduction on your you as a person and your work. So Klaas uh, Gefroy, he studied architecture here at the uh, HFBK Hamburg when it was still possible to study architecture here. And uh, today he is the press and public relations officer, officer, sounds good, for the Hamburg Chamber of Architecture, also as the Pressesprecher der Hamburger Architektenkammer. <laughs> he is also active as a member of the board of the Denkmalverein Hamburg and works as an editor of the Jahrbuch Architektur in Hamburg, Yearbook of Architecture in Hamburg. Furthermore, Klaas works as a freelance architecture journalist, writing in newspapers and magazines such as Taz, Konkret, Die Zeit, Bauwelt, Deutsche Bauzeitung and Baumeister. And now, please welcome with me Klaas Gefroy for his lecture, How much and what memory does the future need? And it's the, the focus is on built testimony on, of Hamburg Jews in the city here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michaela. Dear Michaela, dear Nora, ladies and gentlemen, I'm very pleased about the invitation to this conference, which analyzes a really burning topic in so many different ways. I hope I can make a small contribution with my presentation. The building history of the Jews in the diaspora is not only a reflection of the Jews themselves. The way Jews live, work, pray is always a reflection of the living condition in this diaspora and of the peoples and countries in which they live. This building history is therefore also a testimony to the economic, social and political conditions in which the Jews live. Hamburg, Altona and Wandsbek were different territory, territorial states before they were merged by the National Socialists. The Jewish communities of Hamburg, Altona and Wandsbek formed the Jewish center of Northern Germany for many centuries. In these three cities, there were both Sephardic and Ashkenazi Jews. At the end of the 16th 16th century, the first Sephardic Jews had arrived in Hamburg and in Altona, in Altona too. 
they were so-called new Christians from Portugal. In other words, former Jews who, ha who had converted out of fear of the Inquisition, but were nevertheless persecuted and had to flee. Around the same time, the immigration of Ashkenazi Jews from German-speaking countries and Eastern Europe began, who settled first in Altona and Wandsbek, later also in Hamburg's Neustadt. Here you can see this area. There are differences between the two groups in religious customs and re religious services and the pronunciation of Hebrew. In Hamburg, Altona and Wandsbek thus created the special situation that two Jewish groups, very different both culturally and in social status, lived here side by side as neighbors. The Age of Enlightenment also left its mark on the Jews in Hamburg. The members of the Jewish community stood up for reason, tolerance, and the common good. In 1817, Jewish merchants in Hamburg founded the Neue Israelitische Tempelverein, the New Israelite Temple Association, which was dedicated to reforming the Jewish, Jewish faith and introduced contemporary forms of liturgy against the resistance of the Orthodox. Until the 18th century, the synagogues of both the Orthodox and the Reform Jews were hidden in backyards of the Jewish residential quarters. The arrival of Napoleon's troops in 1806 marked a turning point. Hamburg's Jews were granted all civil and political rights. All restrictions suddenly fell away. In the curse of the reorganization of the state system, according to modern French structures, Jews were also given functions in the new economic and administrative offices. With the abolition of demarcated Jewish ghettos, Hamburg's Jews were thrown into the modern urban world of the 19th century. The Jewish bourgeoisie emancipated itself and the question of the structural form of residential buildings and synagogues germinated. The question was all the more urgent because until then Jews had been forbidden to find independent building forms for their synagogues and buildings. And thus, a Jewish building tradition did not exist. So, the Hamburg Jews decided to adopt the styles prevalent in Germany at the time. The Kohlhöfen Synagogue was built in the round arc style with Renaissance elements. The new temple in Polstraße had Moorish as well as neoclassical and neo-Gothic elements. Finally, the synagogue on Bornplatz was based on Romanesque church buildings. Orientalizing forms were only used once in a while, for example, in the Portuguese synagogue in the Neustadt. This mixture of styles corresponded to the taste of the time and testifies to a new self-confidence of the rising Jewish bourgeoisie. They felt they belonged to German society and wanted to make this clear in their design. Another new feature was that the synagogues were no longer hidden in rows of houses or backyards, but stood freely in space, like the Bornplatz synagogue. But there were also attempts to find approaches to independent synagogue architecture. Josef Karlebach, the chief rabbi of Altona, should be mentioned here, for example. In 1929, he published an essay on the architecture of the synagogue. Here he is. Um, the architecture of the synagogue, in which he explored the question of what a synagogue must be like according to the prescriptions of oral teaching. Karlebach criticized the fact that the synagogues resembled churches and called for independent building forms that were oriented, oriented towards Jewish reeds. Completely in line with the credo of architectural modernism that was spreading at the time, he demanded that the architecture of a synagogue be closely linked to its functions. So I make a jump. Using three Hamburg synagogue buildings as examples, I would like to briefly outline the tension between tradition and reform as well as between independence and adaption. On Bornplatz, today 
Joseph, Josef Kahlebach Platz. The Bornplatz Synagogue was opened in 1906 after two years of construction. The building by architects Ernst Friedheim and Sammy Engel was the first freestanding and also largest Jewish place of worship in Hamburg. Inside, it has 1,200 seats, traditionally separated for men and women. With its 40 meter high dome and the gilded star, da, uh, star of David on top, it proclaimed a new self-confidence of the Jews in Hamburg. Stylistically, the building adapted the prevailing taste of the time. The building was erected in the neo-Romanesque style, the facades in sandstone and brick, as was customary in Hamburg. In its whole appearance, the synagogue gave the impression of a Christian church, except for the Star of David at the top. This was also true of the interior. If it weren't for the Torah shrine and the reading desk, one might think one was in a cathedral. During the November program, pogrom in 1938, the synagogue was des desecrated, vandalized, and set on, set on fire several times. However, it did not go up in flames. In 1939, the Jewish community had to sell the property below value and demolish the building at its own expense. A bunker was later built next to the site to which Jews had no access during the war. In 1817, Jewish merchants in Hamburg founded the Neue Israelische Tempelverein, which was dedicated to reforming the Jewish faith. They modernized the liturgical prayer book and included new hymns in German. This new prayer book of the Tempelverein was the first comprehensive Jewish reform liturgy and aroused opposition in Orthodox, Orthodox Judaism in Hamburg. The aim of the reform was to bring Jewish worship into line with Christian environment. This also included giving the first temple of the Temple Association in Alter Steinweg, an organ, <coughs> pardon, an organ which until then had been reserved for churches. After this temple had become too small, the Temple Association opened its new building in 1844, the temple in Polstraße, which was completely in keeping with the taste of the time with, it, with its classicist and Gothic style elements. Several parts of the building also did not correspond to the conventional building patterns for synagogues and pointed to the reform program. One, un <coughs> pardon, one unusual feature, for example, was a large gate as a common entrance for women and men. Inside there, there was an impressive organ and also a gallery for a choir, also something that had previously only existed in churches. The musical arrangement of the temple service was a sensational reform. The fact that a choir sang in the gallery to organ music <clears throat> the fact that the choir sang in the gallery to organ music in a synagogue was something completely new and triggered heated discussion, discussions. This building and its predecessor were the first reform synagogues ever. They had a great influence on synagogue building far away, far beyond Germany. With the relocation of Jewish life to Harvestehude Roter Baum and the Grindelviertel, the temple was abandoned and finally sold by force in 1937. Today, only the remains of the western porch and the eastern apse remains as ruins of the free nave temple. The main nave was destroyed by a bomb hit in 1944. In 1931, in an already anti-Semitic climate, the successor building, the temple in Oberstraße, opened only a few hundred meters away from the Bornplatz synagogue. The architects Felix Ascher and Robert Friedman built the temple in the new building style, a uh, new building style, as in Neuenbauen, on behalf of the Temple Association. The building consists of a main building and two short side wings has a flat roof and 
unadorned light shell limestone facades. The front is adorned with a large round window whose millions represent a menorah. Below, it is emblazoned a Hebrew, Hebrew inscription. My house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations. The temple was one of the, large, uh, of the last synagogues to be built in Germany before the National Socialists came to power. The Neue Israelitische Tempelverein had sought a radically modern design that was new and unusual for a synagogue, but certainly in keeping with the architectural changes in Germany. Architectural modernism was increasingly gaining ground in Germany. Historicism was on the retreat. But in the early 30s, with the rise of the Nazis and the end of Neues Bauen, was already becoming apparent. So this modern temple was a self-confident sign against reactionary and for progress. It is obvious that this required courage, because at that time there was already a climate that was both anti-modern and anti-Semitic, in which Neues Bauen was denigrated as Jewish, Arabic, primitive. Even more than the exterior, the interior shows an exceedingly modern attitude. The main room with 1,200 seats in the central building broke with the convention of orient, orienting the design of synagogues on the Christian, Christian church building. The worshippers gather on three sides around the Torah shrine and lectern, look at each other, are recognizable as individuals, individuals and do not get lost in a mess. This is entirely in keeping with Josef Kaleba's reformist approach. In addition, the room lacks any sacred or mystical atmosphere. There are large windows with colorless glass, white walls, simple furniture without ornamentation or decoration. One could almost mistake the main room for a, for a university lecture hall. The other rooms, such as the community hall on the left, and the room for the weekly service, also have this functional, rational atmosphere. However, the temple could not be used for long. On the night of the pogroms, the interior was devastated and desacred. In 1941, the building was forcibly sold to the city of Hamburg for far less than its value. In 1950, the Norddeutsche Rundfunk, NDR, NDR, received the building and converted it into the Großer Sensaal, the great broadcasting hall. The NDR still uses the building today as a concert and event venue. In 2000, the building In 2000, the building was once again fundamentally rebuilt and the Rolf Liebermann Hall was installed. A return to the Jewish community and conversion to a synagogue was never considered by the city of Hamburg. The fate, the fate of these three synagogues, Bornplatz, Polstraße, Oberstraße, was not unusual. Everywhere in Germany, synagogues were destroyed, de desecrated, and misappropriated during the pogrom night, night of 38. The difference to other cities is how Hamburg dealt with its Jewish heritage after the end of National Socialism. The Jewish buildings that has survived na National Socialism and the war fell into disrepair or were misused. The ruins of the Israelite temple in Polstraße, for example, were left to their own devices until the end and fell more and more into disrepair. That the remains of the buildings were not demolished was pure luck. And this despite the fact that it was the first liberal Jewish synagogue building ever, a building that translated religious reforms into progressive architecture. Its remains are an important testimony to architectural and religious history far beyond Hamburg. But only now, under pressure from citizens, has the city decided to buy the site with the aim of preserving the ruins. Unfortunately, 
New residential and office buildings will also be built on the site in the immediate vicinity of the ruin and thus will disturb the preserved fragments. The treatment of the successor building, the Israel Light Temple in Oberstraße, is equally worth of criticism. The fact that the North German Broadcasting Corporation was able to move into the building five years after the end of the war, thus permanently depriving the Jewish community of the building, is a great injustice. To this day, the NDR not only uses the building, it even had it rebuilt in 2000 according to its requirements. Like no other Jewish sacred building, this building demonstrated the progressiveness and modernity of Hamburg's Israelite community. It has to be said so clearly, leaving this building in the possession of the city, converting it and using it, contrary to its original functions, is scandalous. In the, in the case of the destroyed Bornplatz synagogue, the city of Hamburg also showed its disinterest for many decades. The Jewish community did not get the property in the Grindelviertel back after the end of the Nazi Germany. Instead, a new synagogue was built in 1960 in modern forms by the architects Karl-Heinz Wongel and Klaus May on Hohe Weide in Eimsbüttel. To this day, it is the only new synagogue built in Hamburg after the war. The site of the destroyed Bornplatz synagogue, on the other hand, was used as a car park. In 1980-80, a floor mosaic by the artist Margaret Karl was created there, depicting the ground plan and the vaulted ceiling of the synagogue on the floor, and thus reminding us of the destroyed building in an abstract form. The neighboring bunker, as you can see here on the right, is still used by the University of Hamburg today. In 2019, the Jewish community caused a stir with the news that it wanted to leave the Hohe Weide synagogue and move into a rebuilt Bornplatz synagogue instead. There was approval for the proposal to rebuild the synagogue in its old form, but there was also dissenting voices. The state rabbi Shlomo Bistritsky, the Bornplatz Synagogue Reconstruction Initiative, Hamburg's first major Peter Tschenger, and the Stadtbild Deutschland Association supported a reconstruction of the Bornplatz Synagogue. That is as true to the original as possible. In 2020, Hamburg's parliament voted unanimously in favor of the reconstruction. In November 2020, the budget committee of the Bundestag released 65 million euros for the reconstruction. The same amount is to come also from the city of Hamburg. The speed with which the city of Hamburg and the federal government together released 130 million euros for the reconstruction makes one wonder. One gets the impression that with this project, Hamburg Senate wants to forget the inactivity committed over decades and numerous mistakes. These include not only the refusal to return Jewish buildings and land to Jews and the Jewish community. Again and again, there were embarrassments and scandals. I would like to mention only a few. I only recall the construction of a shopping center on the site of the former Ottensen Jewish Cemetery. The cemetery was opened in 1663 and closed by the Nazis in 1934. After the Second World War, the property was returned to the Jewish Trust, which sold it to Hertie, Waren and Kaufhaus GmbH in the 1950s. The company built a department store there, you can see it on the right. Gravestones and bones found during the construction were moved to the Oldsdorf Cemetery. In 1990, the site was sold again and was to be built on again, this time with a shopping center called Mercado. Orthodox Jews demanded the return of the site and with their protests against the disturbance of the peace of the dead, achieved a halt to construction. The Jerusalem chief rabbi Itzhak Kolitz 
who was called in as an expert, decided that the soil in which the graves were still presumed had to remain untouched. As a compromise, compromise the site was covered with a large concrete floor plate on which the Mercado shopping center was built. In the basement of the shopping center, a memorial plaque with the names of those buried commemorates the former Jewish cemetery. To this day, it remains a horrible image that people are shopping and that the bones of the dead Jews lie beneath them. A case from our times is the Hannover Schabahnhof Documentation Center in the Hafen city, which is to document, document the deportation of Hamburg's Jews. It is to be housed in a new building located directly on the former railway station site from which the Hamburg Jews were transported to the concentration camps. However, the documentation center is not the only ten uh, tenant of the building. Much of the space in the building has been rented by the company DEA Winterschall. Winterschall was a company that part participated in the plundering of occupied states during National Socialism and en enriched itself from the persecution of Jews. If the plans are not changed, the documentation center will soon find itself next, to, next door to a company that was one of the that was one of the perspectors. That was one of the perspectors. In view of such scandals, the project to rebuild the Bornplatz synagogue came at the right time. Comes at the right time. By approving and financing the reconstruction, the Hamburg Senate can show how much it cares for the Jewish community and the revival of Jewish culture. But it's not only re the reconstruction project itself that is disturbing, but also the way in which it is being pushed forward. Numerous members of the, Hamburg's government, of the Hamburg government, as well as celebrities, supported a campaign that started with the, with the slogan, no to anti-Semitism, yes to Bornplatz synagogue. The slogan makes a yes to the synagogue project to a statement against rampant anti-Semitism. At the same time, all those who are not in favor of the reconstruction in its planned form are ultimately declared anti-Semites. Professor Galit Noga Banai, who teaches art history in Jerusalem, wrote in the Frankfurter Allgemeine, the politically correct sounding slogan plays rather clumsily on the keyboard of moral blackmail because who would want to say yes to anti-Semitism and thus basically makes any objection impossible. Critics of the reconstruction included not only Jewish survivors such as Peggy Parnas or Esther Bejarano, but also numerous historians, artists, politicians politicians and clergy from Israel who, expresses, who express, as, express doubts in the public appeal that a reconstructed synagogue could represent modern Jewish culture. The anti-Semitism researcher and historian Moshe Zimmermann said, Judaism is made visible through content, not through Wilhelminian building. There are many other important questions to which answers are lacking. Doesn't a reconstructive new building of the historic synagogue undo history? Doesn't this make the crimes of the Nazis invisible and prevent their remembrance? A reconstruction could create the illusion that nothing ever happened. Reconstruction on the old side would also destroy Margit Karl's listed place of remembrance, which was once erected to mark the 50th anniversary of the destruction of the synagogue. It is the only place in Hamburg where the program night, program night is public, publicly commemorated every year. By the way, on the initiative of the Hamburg citizens, not the politicians, who never cared about the anniversary. Galit Noga Banai writes, 
The seemingly empty area forms a strong contrast to its immediate surroundings. The memorial site is located in the middle of the university campus in direct neighborhood to the shops and restaurants of the Grindelviertel. This contrast adds to the irritating effect of the memorial site created by Karl, emphasizing the absence of the synagogue and pointing the viewer to the Jewish community that once gathered there to pray and to, and to their fate. Should a replica of the synagogue be erected, the memorial will disappear and with it, and with it the memory of those people and their house of prayer. Last but not least, it must be asked what sign the construction of a new synagogue in historical form sends out. In 1906, the Jews of Hamburg were at the, height, at the height of their times with the architecture of the synagogue. Today, however, reverting to Wilhelminian architecture would be a sign of backwardness and conservatism. In any case, a contemporary response to the current needs of Jewish community would look different Contemporary new synagogue buildings in, for example, Konstanz, Gelsenkirchen, Munich or Dresden show how Jewish communities can implement their needs in contemporary architecture. Galit Nogabanai explains in her article that destroyed sacred buildings are also reconstructed elsewhere and reports on the case of the Hova synagogue in Jerusalem destroyed in the Arab-Israeli War of 84. She wrote, in 1970, a replica of a 16 meter high stone arc of the synagogue was erected on the site as a place of remembrance. For more than 30 years, this arc marked the place where the synagogue had once been. In 2000, however, the Israeli government granted permission to rebuild the Harvard Synagogue. In 2010, the building was inaugurated. Noga Banai sums up, in this ideologically guided endeavor, it was overlooked that a simple arc can make history more impressively present than a complete building. Noga Banai sees parallels with the Bornplatz synagogue. She wrote, Margaret Karl's memorial fulfills the same symbolic function for the Bornplatz synagogue as the Jerusalem Ark did for the Herver synagogue. It was created in the spirit of the anti-memorial or counter-memorial movement of the 1980s and 90s, whose memorial sculptures are often characterized by the fact that they are sunk into the ground, thus triggering uncertainty and self-consciousness in their viewers. Margit Karl's cobblestone mosaic in the Grindelviertel not only serves to mark and recall the absent, it can be seen as, as, as the center of a web laid by hundreds of the so-called Stolpersteine across the neighborhood and the city. Together, they form an archaeological layer of the urban landscape and point to a depth dimension, deep dimension of urban space that cannot be ignored. So much for Galit Nogabanai. To which I would add, the reconstruction of the synagogue out of conservative, conservative, conservative spirit is all the more questionable because the existing legacies of liberal and reform Judaism remain decayed and expropriated. Thus, one history is reviewed and the other history is consigned to oblivion. A selective culture of remembrance is the, re is the result. So, there's much to discuss. But all the good questions and arguments fell on deaf ears. The direction remains unchanged. The synagogue destroyed by the Germans is to be rebuilt on Bornplatz. With all the questionable consequences and implications this, this will have for remembering the pogrom, pogroms and the Shoah and the responsibility of the Germans. The discourse that had only just begun to unfold in civil society is already being ended again by quickly creating facts. This is a fatal signal because 
The memory of the Shoah and the crimes of the Germans against the Jews can only remain alive if this open discourse is continued and no attempt is made, is made to undo history. Thank you. ist schon hier. Jetzt müssen wir einmal uns verbinden. You are now you are currently the only person in this conference. Das stimmt noch nicht. You are now unmuted. Hallo. Hallo Stefan, wir machen jetzt eine kleine Abschlussrunde zu dieser sehr komplizierten Thematik, die da so zusammenkommt. Also vielleicht fangen wir so an, ich fand es sehr schön von Tanja Manceno das äh, Zitat aus Ghana. Should we do it in English or should we do it ah, in Ah, sorry. Uh, my okay. problem is my English is, I think, not so good. And so I, I would prefer to talk in German, but maybe someone want to translate my... Okay, so we do it in English, okay. We do it in English and we will try together to translate. Okay. So I just would like to come back to the quote Tanya mentioned uh, from, uh, the, uh, from, the, from the second speaker, from, okay, from Memory Diva. Yeah, from Madame Memory, <laughs> wonderful name. And uh, she told us about this bird looking backwards and flying forward and it um, immediately comes to um, everyone's mind, uh, Walter Benjamin's uh, angel of history, who is also uh, this looking back and looking in the front at the same time, uh, looking below, yeah, <laughs> sorry, so we, that's the problem about speaking English, uh, okay. No, 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 yeah. I, I did not correct. Okay. You didn't correct, I thought you correct, sorry. <laughs> yeah, and, and so I, I came, come back to uh, the place with the Ezra Pound citation, the quote in, in the middle of the Kohlhoff, uh, Walter Benjamin place. So we are in the middle of this um, uh, horrible conflict of these kind of aura, with what rooms have. And so like Talia mentioned before that she um, is looking on like, buildings that there's always a layer underneath. And so I think that's also for me so important if you go through Germany, for example, you lift up every stone, there's another history beyond. So it's really going uh, very deep. And so it's very hard to think about it, um, what the Bornplatz thing now means and this whole construction, how the city treated the whole history of uh, the, the post-war Jewish society here, what is really a total scandal. And it's also the same thing with other buildings, like you all might know the Stadthaus, Hamburg now, who has been the, the, the Gestapo center at the Neue Wall, and who is now also privatized. And there's only a small, Gedenkraum in, should be in, the, in a shop area, and then the artists who won the competition, they do it now outside of the street with some kind of 
I don't know, some mosaic who re so should like like blood or something. Yeah. I don't know so exactly, but um, but it's not inside. And all this terror was inside this building. And before it was, I think, the mayor's house or something or police. It was no, it was. Um, it was an yeah, official building of the city. I think it was a, a police building. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it, it was, police is not only to persecute people, I would say, so it was also for having some right mm. in the city, and when the Gestapo should, took over, it was only like uh, doing um, things who are not meant to be by police, murdering and torturing people in the basement, and now you only can go in and commemorate when you go to a shopping mall. So. This is really a conflict situation. I, I think uh, maybe we, I don't know how to address this all, it's so big, but it's really, I think, a, a thing in Hamburg uh, that it's all architecture. You could see it's really also an economical tool who is kind of uh, converted. And for me, it's always, every day, I go with my bike by, by the Oberstrasse Temple, and it's always a scandal that I think it's a beautiful concert hall, but why is it not a temple anymore? No. And it's in the former Jewish neighborhood. And mm -hmm. I think you are currently the only person in this conference. Okay, that's not true. <laughs> <It's> not <living>. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's, Stefan, it's Stefan is here. maybe, he, he's gone, so maybe you oh. get him back. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so maybe I don't know how we could address that because, because I think it's the same problem uh, you are addressing in the post-colonial studies uh, with this kind of overlaying of neighborhoods and people who came from uh, the south or from the global south of like uh, uh, immigrants with the, with the ships and so on and they live in, in precarious neighborhoods. And now if they got a kind of an economic interest, these people are shipped out and goes, they have to go somewhere else. So maybe we could think about that because, um, but Stefan beautifully lined out that there's a huge interest in today building up this kind of um, Heimat. Uh, you are currently the only person in this conference. Some, History, this castle, this Ritterburgen, this uh, uh, mm -hmm. rural things, and also uh, in the city, like this, mm -hmm. referring to um, like the, the, the inner city of, of Frankfurt. Um, so maybe I will uh, answer in German and someone translate it. I will um, try. My English is, uh, my English is <laughs> not so good, but <laughs> I will do my much. best. Also, ich glaube, worum es ja dabei geht, ist um, Letztendlich immer, es ist eine Art von selektiver Wahrnehmung und es ist ein selektives Weitererzählen von Geschichte. Ähm, das ist das, was Stefan Trübe ja letztendlich dargestellt hat, dieses Rekurrieren auf äh, ganz bestimmte Bauformen aus ganz bestimmten Epochen. Ähm, und das ist auch das, was ich versucht habe jetzt eben natürlich äh, darzustellen in Hamburg. Ähm, ähm, und es wird dann wirklich interessant, weil ähm, gerade in der jüdischen Tradition Hamburg hat, gab es eben immer beides. Es gab die konservative Richtung und es gab aber eben auch die Reformjuden. Und äh, was heute eben durch den Wiederaufbau dieser Synagoge weitererzählt wird, ist dann der eher konservative Zweig und die Hinterlassenschaften äh, der Reformjuden, eben zum Beispiel dieser Tempel in der Polstraße, werden mehr oder minder sich selbst überlassen. Und, äh, okay, ich glaube, hier muss ich jetzt probieren. Okay, also das ist, glaube ich, der, der wichtige Punkt. Es ne? ist eine selektive Wahrnehmung und eine selektive Erzählung. Okay, so. I try, you help me. Um, the, in, in, in many of those cases, and also in the Hamburg case, we, it's, we see something that you call selective perception. We, some things are seen, some histories are told, others are just overseen. And very concretely, as I, as I understand, in relation to the Jewish community here in Hamburg, there have always been very strong uh, threats going in both directions, in the direction of the more conservative, um, religious group, and of a more modernistic reform group. 
and while one of the group has hegemony and is doing the history telling, which is the more conservative one, the history of the reform group, which also came with this modernistic temple, has been forgotten. Mm -hmm. So maybe also this in this context, it also belongs the uh, naming of all these new places in the Hafen City. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about that, like the Vasco da Gama place and so on, just named this in last year. Yes, okay. I, I do have to um, correct a little bit because the, the, the quote about the <coughs> Ghanaian bird was from um, Oyundo in Meli, Spain. So the okay. first track and um, Sankofa is, of course, um, a known feature in um, Ubuntu um, philosophy in which you, co you look at back to, un to understand the future or to portray the muted. future, right? But you're right in this parallel, which I have unseen with Benjamin, and it's just fascinating to see how the entanglement between um, decolonial thinking and Jewish you are um, currently the only understanding person in of this time um, can be really um, in a dialogue. And I think, I'm not sure if I could go back to the Haven City right now, but um, talking to the, about the bon, bon Platz synagogue, I see um, a difficulty in which, um, which is not really um, dealt with in the press or in the discussions. I mentioned this yesterday to a couple of students here from the HFPK. So the thing is, uh, we have this place called Allendeplatz at the other side of um, the synagogue. And this, Platz wa th this place was named after many protests you are of currently um, the only person people in this from conference. Chile who were exiled here, right? And um, they, yeah, they got this place, which is actually a parking play, uh, a parking lot only, but um, they do gather there together to commemorate the 11th of September in which uh, Allende was, um, was killed. So this is not even a subject with the reconstruction. And I think that's really problematic that we have always to this... Um, this conflict among memories. Why can't we just, yeah, why, why then just let, I mean, authorities should let us speak because we do get a, a way of translating our demands, but the official side is always saying, no, we just can't commemorate one. As you just said, like the, like the conservative um, point of view in the Jewish architecture, we're just commemorating this and nothing else. And I think that's really, really problematic and violent, yes. You have an idea why the um, the people who um, wants to remember about Allende, Allende um, don't don't have a voice in Hanmok? Do you have an, any idea? I mean, the um, people from Chile they, they they also have a publication about how mm -hmm. they um, managed to change the name of the um, mm -hmm. of the parking lot, or which was a street, of course, and then became a parking lot, but. Um, um, they know what it is happening, but nobody is speaking to them. So they are organizing and looking what could be our options, but I don't know of any dialogue between Jewish communities and uh, people yeah, um, fighting for the Allende Platz. Yeah. So you see yeah, the yeah, difficulties there. Yeah. Just mentioning that uh, broader context uh, because maybe the foreigners might, uh, foreigners might not know that all these new uh, structures built in the Hafen City, there are all the places named after um, the big um, Entdecker, what is it, uh, discoverer. I would call them criminals, but yes. <laughs> yeah, no. yeah. You're totally right, but uh, you know what I mean. And I don't think they are, are uh, quoted in, on the on the street signs. That mm -hmm. no. And they, when they were in in uh, in um, opened, there was a huge pre protest always coming with when the. Yes, you are talking about the Vespucci Platz, which. Um, yeah, probably there can be also some anti-Semitic connections, which I don't know. But uh, yeah, it, it, it wouldn't be surprising to see um, how the genealogies of violence are entangled with one another from colonial uh, to uh, for, from colonialism and ra racism to anti-Semitism. 
Ich glaube, Entschuldigung, ähm, ich glaube, man darf einen Faktor natürlich dabei nicht unter vergessen. Hamburg ist eine Handelsstadt und eine Kaufmannsstadt, die extrem reich geworden ist, eben mit der Ausbeutung äh, dieser Kolonien. Und das ist eben natürlich was anderes als in Berlin oder München. Ähm, Hamburg war die Hafenstadt, von der aus die Schiffe eben losfuhren. Und, äh, ähm, und bis heute gibt es ja auch diese Kaufmannsfamilien. Und äh, bis heute gibt es diesen Reichtum, der eben aus dieser Ausbeutung und Versklavung von Menschen eben äh, äh, entstanden ist. Und äh, ich glaube, das erklärt ein bisschen auch, warum es da diese, diese Blindheit gibt. Weil natürlich diese, diese wirtschaftlichen Kräfte ja auch heute noch existent sind und auch natürlich viel Einfluss und Macht haben in der Stadt. Yeah, I wanted to think about the history of the Sephardic community in, in Hamburg. Ah, should I just say it? No, I can just say it first in German and then in English. Ah, what? Are you speaking German? Yes. Oh my God. I'm so sorry, I didn't get it. I can try, I can Thank try, you. Madam, because I was really listening to you. And um, yes, so um, you mentioned the idea that, um, because I'm sitting next to him, that's why I I'm meant, sorry. I'm so please, sorry. Please do yes. it, please. But uh, yeah, so uh, you said that this is like the tradition of Hamburg, right? This naming after um, criminals, what we call a Kaufmännerische um, Tradition. So, um, which is actually, yes, uh, an extractivism tradition which yeah. have been yeah. put into place from the north uh, to the south. And that's why you mentioned that uh, the families are still basing their wealth on the exploitation of resources from the south. And that's why <laughs> you have this kind of selective memory you mentioned. I would put it in terms of Françoise Vergès, for, for example, and call, call them politics of forgetfulness, because it's actually, um, yes, not listening to the communities here speaking and say, we don't want another Bespucci Platz. Why, why, do, don't, why do we need something like this in Hamburg if Bespucci is already being commemorated? It's not even um, canceling Bespucci which is just, <laughs> come on, let's have a little bit different uh, names also, right? Yeah, so it's a decision not to, um, not to, not, not to remember also. Thank you, and sorry for my selective perception. Obviously, I was already in my question, so like, um, but I can say it in English, yeah? Um, so my question relates to the Sephardi community in, Hamburg and its history. So obviously this, I mean, it's the history of people coming from Portugal in the 15th, 16th century to Hamburg. Concretely, this is all based on the programs in 1492 in Spain. So we could say there is a beginning of capitalism, colonialism and antisemitism that in somehow really, or, I mean, it's a demarcation point in the 15th century that also, and with it, also starts the history of migration to Hamburg. And then these people, they work in the harbor yes. and become then also entangled as perpetrators in the history of colonialism. Um, but this is, a, this is, I think, a very important uh, layer of you the Jewish the history of Hamburg. You are currently the only person in this conference. That is also often overseen or um, I guess also in the Jewish community. And I, um, now that we know that there will be a museum of migration in Hamburg, I was thinking that it could be really interesting to start it in the 15th century and then to look at these histories and entanglements from this also longer history of migration and exploitation, because it was of course also a history of migrant labor. Also darauf antworte ich dann vielleicht doch auch nochmal auf Deutsch, weil das ist dann schon ein bisschen komplizierter. Also man kam ja, also die sephardischen Juden kamen ja aufgrund der Inquisition und äh, der Verfolgung. Und äh, sie, in Hamburg haben sie natürlich ja auch erstmal, doch ich sag mal, wirklich in sehr 
zurückgezogenen Verhältnissen gelebt. Also sie konnten ja noch nicht teilhaben an der Gesellschaft. Das änderte sich ja wirklich erst in dem Moment, äh, in dem Moment, äh, in dem äh, Napoleons Truppen kamen und eben äh, ganz neue Strukturen schufen und eben auch ähm, die Eingrenzung der Juden eben beendeten. Also das ist wirklich ein, ein ganz entscheidender Punkt, dass zu diesem Zeitpunkt die Juden dann eben wirklich alle, alle Rechte, alle bürgerlichen Rechte erhielten und eben auch als Kaufleute zum Beispiel aktiv werden konnten. Ähm, sehr erfolgreich dann eben natürlich, genau. Also sie waren natürlich auch Teil eben einer, einer Oberschicht hier in, in Hamburg. Aber, aber auch nicht so die Sephardischen. Auch, aber noch mehr die ne? Das weiß ich jetzt nicht genau. Also ob man diese beiden Gruppen jetzt sozusagen dann, und die einen waren die Kaufleute und die anderen äh, haben andere Dinge gemacht, das weiß ich nicht, ähm, ehrlich gesagt. Aber ähm, das war natürlich für sie wirklich dann äh, etwas völlig Neues und sie haben natürlich ihre Chance dann eben auch genutzt und äh, dann äh, sind dann auch Teil dieser Gesellschaft geworden. Ähm, wobei es natürlich unterschwellig auch immer den Antisemitismus trotzdem ja auch weiterhin gab, auch in der, äh, in der sozusagen originär deutschen äh, äh, Mehrheitsgesellschaft und auch unter den äh, Großbürgerlichen. Also das war immer natürlich ein Thema, so, ne, diese Konkurrenz eben auch. Ne? Okay, I try to translate. So part, uh, so in, with the Spanish Inquisition, people were fleeing. So you had Jewish refugee coming from the, from the Inquisition from Portugal to Hamburg. And the Jews in Hamburg had no rights, no civil rights until they were given to them with Napoleon. And only from them they started also to engage in um, in the bourgeois society and in the economy. And then also some were um, successful in it. Now, what we did not agree was the question um, if there was, a, I mean, if, if we could say that there is an ethnicization of the class situation of the Jewish community in Hamburg, because of course, there were, I mean, there were Jews in all the classes, you can say, and um, I, As I see it, there is an ethnicization of this class situation, so you would have more Sephardic Jews coming from this history of Portugal in the working class and more Ashkenazi Jews in the bourgeois class, but of course not only. With these civil rights, there was a possibility to engage in the society, this is what you said, and as, as soon as it, ha as it happened, um, Jews were involved also in economic exploitation. Um, from the Hamburg side. Vielleicht noch ein Nachtrag, ähm, weil das äh, war mir auch neu, das habe ich dann auch gelernt ähm, zu der Beschäftigung mit dem Thema, ähm, dass diese beiden Gruppen, ähm, die sephardischen Juden und die aschkenasischen Juden, wirklich, obwohl sie quasi Tür an Tür lebten, in getrennten Welten lebten. Und äh, dass sie miteinander zu tun kam, äh, bekamen, war auf den Transporten in die KZs und in den KZs. Also so fürchterlich, wie das klingt. Aber es war so, die haben wirklich vorher in sehr getrennten Welten äh, voneinander gelebt. Also ja, wie, das, wie die Klassengesellschaft auch sonst in Deutschland. Um, but I just translate. Um, so it sounds horrible, but Sephardic Jews and Ashkenazi Jews were not very related to each other. So for, for you it sounds horrible. I think it's just class society. But um, as you learned, since not a long ago, um, many Sepha like not many Sephardic people had a lot of contact with Ashkenazi people and then met Ashkenazi people, met Sephardic people sometimes, and this is the horrible part, only when they went to the concentration camp, where, like had to go, were forced to leave and then got to know each other, only then. You wanted to say something, Edi, no? Yeah, thank you very much for the presentations. Um, it's a pity that uh, uh, Stefan is not here any longer because uh, Mina and I, we were this morning speaking actually about um, uh, these castles and the obsession of, of, of Nazis with this like medieval culture. So I, I, I would have uh, wanted to ask him like, like what, if he, if he could speak a little more about this um, obsession, the Nazi obsession with castles. Um, I mean, he mentioned it, but like to go a little bit more into detail. Um, we spoke about uh, Jörg Lanz von Liebenfels and what's the other guy's name? 
um, Guido von Liszt, like this kind of pre, um, I don't know, d d d d d neo paganist, uh, Germanic, um, homeopathic, um, I don't know, front runners. So, yeah. Uh, Nordic. Nordic. But, Nordic. <laughs> but okay, he's, he's not here, but um, um, I, I, I would have. Uh, Another remark and, 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 and also a question about, about this um, uh, kind of uh, practice of, of, of renewing uh, synagogues, rebuilding them. Um, first of all, I think it's a little misleading, that's a remark, it's a little mis misleading to use the term conservative here um, in this debate because I understand you, you, you use it in a political way, but conservative is also a religious term in Judaism and um, it's a denomination that is kind of in between the, the liberal progressive uh, denomination and the uh, orthodox um, and, and it's a little misleading here uh, uh, when we speak about uh, especially also synagogues. Um, and um, however, I also, I, I'm, I'm a little confused about this question of, of the political position when it comes to the reconstruction. Like me personally, I. I never thought that it was an interesting idea to rebuild the synagogue as it was destroyed. Um, I have to say, I, I, I spoke uh, yesterday about that in the, in the, in the example of, um, uh, of Hamburg. Um, and now when I heard that actually the Jews were forced to take it down, if I understood you correctly, um, when, the, when the plot was sold, they were forced to like, tear down the synagogue, right? And given this part of the story, I, th I think that's another aspect to consider when we, when we judge about the question of, of, of rebuilding. Um, that's, that's one thing I would like to say. And the other thing um, is that, that in terms of like political conservatism, um, I was uh, um, speaking to some people from the synagogue at the Frankl Uwe in Berlin, um, which is an orthodox community, but a modern orthodox community, like they would consider themselves, I would say, progressive. I don't know if any Berliners are here and they could, um, they, they would agree on that, but they would, they are like a, a, a politically progressive community, I would say. And they also want to rebuild their, their synagogue. They are praying now in a side wing that was not destroyed, but the one that was destroyed should also be rebuilt. And I also didn't understand, but they were really like convinced that that's a good idea, like progressive people, politically progressive. Um, yeah, and, and, and these were now a couple of, okay. <laughs> of remarks and one question. Um, what I didn't understand, I mean, we were also at, at the same tour yesterday uh, and, and you, like we spoke about this, uh, the, the question you mentioned, the Allende uh, Square uh, yesterday. What I don't understand is w um, why it is necessarily an impossibility, that's how I understand you, that a synagogue would be there and the Allende Square. Like, like, why is it, like, to, to call for the, for the reconstruction of the synagogue, why is that a violent act, as you called it? Okay, just uh, really quickly, uh, it's not uh, even being discussed. That's my point. So nobody really acknowledged that there's a place where uh, ex exiliated people meet um, once a year to commemorate. That was my point. So, um, yeah, if it's not part of the discussion, we can think that nobody's paying attention to the communities who um, have created some relationship of belonging to that place. Yeah, but I think that's the whole point, that there's no awareness of the, mm -hmm. the other in, in all these dis the discussions. And for example, the Pool Straße Temple, as far as I could see here in Hamburg, it's for many, many years it's a discussion that this thing is just a car repair shop and uh, it's really um, a horrible place. And like artists have done here things, theaters, and it was so often kind of brought in the public and even in the newspaper. Mm. And so, and suddenly it's sold to this investor who is now doing something, integrating this rest of the temple. So this is, uh, Incredible, and mm -hmm. I think this is how I understood you. It's not so much to get back to Edie 
uh, I think that uh, the community, the Israelite community, will build this, rebuild this temple. I think uh, they can do what they want uh, because there's so many buildings in Germany who um, also got some bombs and they were rebuilt and they were fascist building and so on. So if they need for the community this is a special building they can do, and, but it would be better to talk with the others and as well. The, the, the yes. museum, like you mentioned, the Völkerkunde Museum, which is the ori origin of the university, like we mentioned two days ago, um, as the Institute for Ethno Ethnology, uh, it's now renamed as a Museum am Roten Baum für Kunst und Kultur. And so there has things happened, and it's a Hamburg Museum, so mm -hmm. there should have been some awareness in the city not to name new places after these uh, criminals, like we said. So why is this at the same time decided where another big institution uh, is renamed after a long fight? Yes. And uh, this is really, I can't believe that. Okay, I would like to add something also in relation to your presentation, but I'm sure you also want to comment on that, because um, it's not just about the racialized others, it's also about the um, the history of the own community, right? So you mentioned that already in your presentation, but um, I mean, the plague which was put into place, it was privately financed at the beginning. And every time there has been ritualistic practices of commemorating and mourning, it has been private um, from the communities. And uh, after so many years, then the state comes and says, we are giving you this. So this texture is really cynical. It is cynical. And uh, I will not just call it like, um, like um, selective memory, but whitewashing of history. We should call it like that, yes. I have three people who want to speak from here. So le let's have all three of them, one after the other, and then you react. Um, my name is Rasmus Gerlach. I want to make a small uh, remark to this very interesting debate about the synagogue. Um, I think it's uh, very valuable today uh, to speak about uh, it here. And I want to add only a few words because um, I was the one that was uh, going with Peggy Panas uh, to film her small uh, protest in the uh, Crystal Night um, manifestation because uh, she had the idea before that nobody there will come from the media and cover it. And it was how it was because uh, uh, the critics uh, of this new building is very uh, complicated and the big media don't want to cover this critic. And uh, the critic uh, by Peggy Panas, who is now the only person uh, remaining who has been as a child in the liturgy, in the synagogue, is more a, a critic of the, of the use of a very huge building. It has nothing to do about how this building was looking, uh, but it's more a, a practical uh, critic that uh, it feels not very good to be with few people in a too big building. Okay, this is what I yeah, want to yeah, add. Yeah, totally right. Um, I think it's a building. It's a building from yesterday with um, with a huge uh, room for 1,200 people. And uh, I think how many members are in the Jewish community today in Hamburg? Uh, 2,000 or something. Um, you, d you simply don't need this huge room, and uh, but instead you need uh, other rooms and other functions. And uh, so this is completely strange. You have got uh, this, this old building with new functions in it. And uh, uh, it's a bit like um, uh, the Berliner Schloss. Uh, uh, it's the same, same thing. And maybe perhaps of the same thinking. Uh, you, you have got historic facades and uh, something new in it. And uh, yeah, I, for me, it's, it's, it's problematic. It's also problematic because you have um, the 
die, ähm, die Nasse, na, ähm, also ich sage es nochmal auf Deutsch, die, die Zäsur des Nationalsozialismus und der, der Vernichtung der Juden wird natürlich mit diesem Wiederauferstehen der alten Form ein Stück weit negiert. Also das hatte ich auch schon im, im Vortrag gesagt. Ich glaube, das ist ein entscheidender Punkt. Das ist, es könnte der Eindruck entstehen, als wäre nichts gewesen. So. Und, äh, und da stehen verschiedene Gruppen natürlich gegeneinander. Also die jüdische Gemeinde möchte wirklich den Wiederaufbau in der alten Form, weil sie wieder an ihre Geschichte anknüpfen wollen. Das ist ein berechtigter Standpunkt. Aber aus meiner Sicht ist es genauso ein berechtigter Standpunkt zu sagen, wir können diese Zäsur, das, was die Deutschen da getan haben, das können wir nicht einfach sozusagen wieder negieren, so indem da wieder ein Gebäude steht, so als wäre nichts gewesen. Aber, uh, but I, I Somebody think has to translate. We have, we have to translate it. I, I would uh, respond and uh, not agree with you. Um, It is that, that the building, like here the quote of Rasmus was, that it's too big and it can't be used in the same way like it was used. And, uh, it, and you compared it in a way to the Berliner Schloss, which is now, uh, you, you have the outside somehow pretending to be, the, be the, uh, to be the Schloss, but only from one side. And inside you have a different height of the uh, roof and it's just a, a white cube thing for some other events. And um, I just, You are currently the I, only person in this but conference. But I think, and, and you wanted to say that there is, uh, if they build the synagogue, they um, there is kind of, it's more difficult to remember what had happened, what kind of crime, and that it was, uh, was done to the Jewish population here and in Germany and in all other countries where the Nazis did destroy these temples. But I think um, it's not comparable to the, to the Schloss. In a way, if you say, okay, there's a facade and you do something different inside, but it's coming out of the community that they won't have a desire for this place to kind of repair it or connect in a way. And I think it's not to us to say, you can't do that. Um, because like we said earlier in the day, they know what happened and we have to remember. So we have to find a different way to remember that. And uh, if they want to have the building back, they can get it. I either would say they should get every building in the city back what they owned, and the NDR should the hell move out of there and uh, give it back. And they could do a, a Jewish concert hall or a Jewish museum or whatever. They could do what they want there and decide what kind of uh, religious places they want and whatever things they want to do in this. Uh, houses, but it belonged to them, and they never got the money back for it. So it was kind of taken away. And uh, in the Stadtschloss, it's more kind of a inner German kind of uh, idea how to be, be great again, I would say. <laughs> and it's totally wrong because the wrong things go inside. Okay, I have two more mm. people who want to say something actually. Mm. So. We just tried to respond. What you said, so now we want to hear the floor. <laughs> Hello. Uh, um, <laughs> so um, I'm Pina, and what if it's still? We can't hear you. Also, also, yeah, I'm really nervous, so <laughs> it's even worse that I need to stand up now, <laughs> but it's okay. So I'm Paulina and I'm studying uh, here at Hafika. And yeah, first of all, thank you for uh, your inputs. And for now, I find it quite uh, challenging to bring together these really, like also different layers of, um, yeah, discourses in one space to talk about it because I think that the perspective that Tanya Mancino was giving uh, 
through her talk, the question of like decolonial practices and social context and also social practices. Um, and the input that you and also, I forgot his name, like the other, um, <laughs> Stefan. <laughs> yeah, we're more concentrated on like architecture and um, yeah, so I also see Nora's point that she was pointing out. Um, now that I just take this um, one um, element of the discourse where you said, okay, there will be like a museum of migration built here and how to like, um, how to weave all these threads together to this complex net that it is obviously, but somehow I find it really challenging to, um, to bring all this together and what I often like, what often frustrates me is when I'm in the spaces or when I'm in a space like this and we are talking about these topics and I feel like, okay, whom are we talking to and how can also these structures of discourse change because when we are talking about the possibility of decolonial spaces or of politics of remembrance that could be different in the future or like that we are asking how can remembrance develop from the way how we do it in the present towards different practices, social practices in the future or in the present. So what I want to ask all of you or like especially you two that are still present now um, is how you like address um, the question of social practices in regarding to the production of space also, like how do you relate the, um, the social practice of, um, yeah, also making a diverse and um, like, how can I say, like a pluralistic discourse yeah, to make the first step into a different pattern of production of space. I think this is also the, um, or this is how I feel could be a direction to move to, so yeah. <laughs> should, should we take Lunhan's point in so that we can a bit move on? You are currently the only person in this conference. I'm sorry, I will divert a bit because first of all, thank you very much for the three very fascinating contributions. I just wanted to say that um, Tanya, when I did see your presentations beginning, I was very excited because I thought about the sonic layers that actually are inscribed in monuments or places and are like anchors how to remember and I wanted to bring, I want to loan this term by the artist Urban Farrell who talks about the term fossilized frequencies and bring the attention to uh, one work by Leo Asemoto, who worked with the British Museum, where they had the Benin artifacts and one of them bronzes put in a vacuum room and they put uh, microphones inside the heads and they uh, recorded the sounds, the whistles that are in the vac vacuum. And uh, one thing that I also wanted to just bring here to the attention of Memora Beaver, uh, other than being a fantastic scholar, is also uh, very active when it comes to sound. So she also did the research in the Bas Laut Archiv, where she did think, like, uh, listen to the wax rolls that were being taken from Namibia and kind of like did try to see if she can also transcribe what was on there because she would understand some brackets. And she has also a very beautiful and fantastic active sound uh, collab, which is called Pungwe with Robert Machiri. So I just want to say that there's a lot of chance also within the sonic sphere. Yeah, it was mm -hmm. just a comment. Yeah, <clears throat> I would like to, to answer the question what to do. I think um, mm, it's up to the people. Um, they have to do something. They have to protest. They have to connect to each other. I think this is uh, in a 
very close society like in Hamburg, uh, the only way to to initiate a change. And uh, yeah, you need the media for it. Uh, I think this is very important. Um, as you see, um, the Temple Polstrasse is a, is a good example. Um, the buildings are ruins and uh, uh, Maybe in, in 20 years there will nothing, uh, uh, nothing there, and um, but then some people have connected uh, to each other and and um, initiated a protest, and uh, um, and they they did it for many years, and uh, <clears throat> and now you have. And now the the city of Hamburg um, um, buys the place and and will preserve these uh, ruins. I think this is this is one possibility to initiate a change. Okay, thank you. Th those are really th difficult questions, and there are so many places that pop up to mind while talking about what is the. Um, what is the right strategy to reconstruct or not? I'm really thinking parallelly to the fact that um, the tent of Lampedusa um, group, who has who who were who was built also as a, a monument, a denkmal, a mahmal, if you want, uh, which should remember us of um, yeah forced migration from Africa to Europe, was um, dismantled during the pandemic and. Um, of course, because of reasons of health, and now, or that's what they said, and then public health, and now it, they are um, still struggling to bring it back. So, I think it's really painful to see how even a stuff walls, walls of stuff made of um, not not stones, right, but just uh, fabrics are um, not not even that we cannot get that reconstruction of places of memory of other minorities who do not have the, the same rights and the same um, the same voice to be heard about so it's interesting to see the parallels there or the yeah the, the the impossibility of a dialogue. Uh, regarding the social practices of creating different space specialities or discourses about space, I would just um, uh, like, um, I, I would repeat myself from the beginning of my presentation. I don't think, as you just said, uh, I mean, it's not possible to do that those practices alone. You have to uh, learn to listen, to listen to other languages and make visible the history, the entanglements. So I do teach at the University of Hamburg and 90% uh, of the students do not know that this university was built with the diamonds coming from South Africa. And when I tell the story to African students from Nigeria or Ghana, they say, oh, so it belongs to us. And I think that's fascinating. That's really fascinating that there may be ways of telling history of really colonial places, but, but which entangled history and to make you have another narrative which includes African voices, Jewish voices, um, voices of so-called minorities, yes. So I think it's okay. really important uh, to not get instrumentali instrumentalized by the by the politics. Um, um, this is really important uh, because a senate, uh, politicians, and uh, uh, they always um, they always look. Um, ja, ich sag's mal auf Deutsch. Also das das Beispiel mit der Synagoge ist ist da schon mit der Bornplatz Synagoge ist da schon sehr profundes, weil ähm, diese Unterstützung, die dieses Projekt in ganz kurzer Zeit erfahren hat, also auch mit erheblichen Geldbeiträgen, äh, hat natürlich was damit zu tun, dass man sich als Politik ja auch in eine bestimmte Richtung äußern und präsentieren will und damit auch Fehler aus der Vergangenheit überdecken will. Und äh, ich glaube, deshalb ist es äh, sehr wichtig, dass man einfach auch immer überlegt, sozusagen, wie reagiert Politik und äh, wie kann ich... Widerstand ähm, auch so organisieren, dass ähm, Politik nicht ihr eigenes Süppchen daraus kocht. Ja, yeah, just quickly a translation. So, um, it seems important to find ways that are not that are not completely. 
politicians by the existing political structures. And the example of the Bonplatz synagogue is a good example where obviously um, public money, there has been a lot of public money put in the project. It seems as if this would be also a way to create a huge symbol for things that have not been done in the past or are not done now. Um, and, and in order to not leave this symbolic politics there, it would be important to create um, contexts and practices of resistance that go also beyond and behind and over the logics of politics. Yeah, and now I would say we stop with that because we are much over the time and unfortunately we couldn't get uh, Stefan in. And I thank you so much and we do a little break and then we make a little close um, around with everybody here uh, on the whole conference and I would like you to stay and then we would like to address Paulina's question again because I think this is all what uh, the, the, the main thing what brought us all here in the room and so we maybe can share a little bit more about what can be done. Okay, okay so see you what, in ten what we propose is a 10 minutes break and then we all sit here on the floor, we make something like a circle as we wish, we just sit together here on the floor and then we start a common discussion that could start the question of first, first steps to more democratic, more emancipatory spaces. See you in 10 minutes here after a coffee.
Let's see if there is anything that can be actually brought together, if there is anything that is to be taken away, that is to be said or asked or shared to end this. And I thought that Paulina's question was really opening for that. Um, I think that many, many things were said, were on the table, sad things. And unfortunately, we also had to realize that many of these knowledges are kept pretty apart, usually. And now, I mean, what I heard from Paulina's question was, okay, now that, we, now that this was said, now that we said these things together in one space, what, what are the spatial consequences for it? How to build other spaces, more democratic spaces of remembrance? This, I think, what, this was Paulina's question, and I would ask us to share and just thoughts about it. So if nobody says something, I will say something. So here in Hamburg, we have some uh, beautiful examples for how things could change. And for example, the uh, site with Park Fiction is m mainly the prominentest one, I would say, in the city. As you might know, at that place should be built a, a hotel or something. And then through these activities of this Park Fiction group, uh, together with the neighbors, um, at the end they managed that there was still, is still the park. And also the whole engagement came out of an artistic um, impulse of Christoph Schäfer and Mark Zenki and others. And at the end they were invited to Documenta, uh, the Documenta uh, Oqui Envisor was, I think it's 12 or what was it? I, I, it don't, it's not so important which document it was, but so it's now this kind of cultural thing in the city who can't be so easy taken away again as a kind of economic um, slot. So this is very important. And so I would just really stretch out that it's all about kind of this movement, like Klaas already said, who comes from not with politics, but against politics or in the direction of politics to address all these topics and try to get um, communities and many voices together, I would say. And for example, there's also one good example, like Tanya is doing this very super city walks uh, where she goes to this, all these sites of post-colonial history and I think it's so much just about education, learning, listening, and learning where you go, what has happening here before, and that leads to projects of Talia and so on. I think we just have to go for it. Um, we talked about this before, but the potential of um, education and changing things with education, and I wanted to maybe give this ask: um, How can we overcome these limits of the potential? Just a question of knowledge, but it's of um, different other resources. If, but I, let me just ask you, if you say fascist discourses, or you mean something else? No, I'm talking about you uh, and speaking about classism. System just by educating. Yeah, uh, I think uh, I heard a lot of ways here that have been presented to us, but I'm uh, sort of 
also I'm irritated um, how, in a way, we uh, speak <laughs> about um, it, how the hierarchies. the way how it is dealt in public or by the politicians and it's hard to grab but I thought it was so sad that it was announced as a dialogue sort of way to talk about things and the now we sit in a what we're doing but yeah I felt from the tables with the white the white tables in the canteen from here, how we're told when to speak or not, and how much time we have after every um, talk. I think, yeah, there's something reproduced in the way this conference is shaking. <laughs> but I'm really, yeah, it really, yeah, made me angry in a way. And you are very right about the white table. What is that? And so, this is kind of strange. But, you know, and thing was not fine, I would say. You are totally. Um, yeah, sorry. I, I mean, I, I, I think I disagree. I agree with you. I disagree with that a conference has to have a podium. I, I don't think anything has to be like this. And um, yeah, I'm, I also I want to to talk about like um, I mean we talk about how like to remember collectively, but we also have to think about like uh, like how do how do collectives work or how you know do we uh, how do we work together and not reproduce the things within the collect the, the what we call collective. Um, that we criticize. Um, yeah, maybe just to. to uh. I actually, I actually disagree with you. <laughs> I think that it was great that we did it like this. And and I have installed uh, the the Vatina assemblies, where we really try also online to create. Of discussing with guests, organizing ourselves, starting every seminar with a plenary session, rethinking the idea how education could be. I totally invite you to come there. They, in, we negotiate these power relations. I hope you will come because actually it's easier to get all of you when we do it like this. But some people come and we enjoy work on these democratic spaces. Now, I think that what we tried to do here um, was an intervention in powerful performances, also through the means of powerful performances. And students together, we could have thought it but he, what we wanted with, with what we did was uh, an intervention in a discourse that in a way um, tears apart struggles that have to be sought together. And to do that, we wanted to create so important and so necessary and I not about just um, cognitive and it's also about affective understanding and that's exactly what you are expressing so thank you 
I, I think it's really important that we feel angry, as your um, former professor said. If you're not angry, you're not listening, right? Uh, or not paying attention. So, yes. Because if you can talk about racism and fascism and feel comfortable, there's something really wrong with you. So, um, in order to understand more and beyond language, beyond just um, dates and facts, all When, when I look back about these three days, I had the feeling that it was good that everyone who talked here was really important. But on the other hand, I, had, I can understand you that it was so much and it was not enough time to talk with everybody. So I could go on, like the last panel we had, we could go on for hours. What does this uh, kind of power structure of the city mean? Like, like you can experience how architecture is dealt with and architecture means uh, how you can feel in a city, what is your space and so on. And uh, so we could, uh, it could be a whole And for, uh, for just speaking for me and Nora, we did this like classical setting while uh, anybody was only allowed to speak for 20 or tw at least 25 minutes. And so the easiest thing is to do it up there and then have a discussion. And now we have to, we only have not enough time to, to deepen up all these things. So we are totally full. <laughs> okay, yeah. Um, I just want to add that I, I came too late. Like was at the at Hauptbahnhof before and I uh, observed uh, the protest of the QuerdenkerInnen and all the Nazis and the people who are against uh, I was really overwhelmed by it because there was no organized counter protest and uh, I couldn't define other people like me who are against alone and then I came here and really nice discussion and I think so too like I want to continue your thought of how can we continue this talk because now we are at the point where we can maybe transform this classical um, I don't know staging and the classical um, I feel a lot of anger and I feel like I want to do something practical and to be activated within a group and yeah, maybe we, we find more time, I don't know, room or level. Um, yeah, so um, what I s um, so yeah, now that we are sitting in a circle, it feels completely different to talk to one and another. And um, this is also what I f um, feel like, um, Tana, you were also pointing it out, the way of uh, knowing and the way of listening and how we learn to listen also. and. This is what I also really, really miss here in this institution and generally in institutions. Um, all are living with a body and in a body and how we communicate also and listen and how we also create spaces where our bodies can be present with all the movement that is going on. And 
sometimes I feel the way that people are talking with one another that the um, that already through the language we speak that the places where we all speak this kind of language and from a person who is just or a person who would just like see this ah yeah there's a symposium going on I will go there and then Yeah, sometimes um, wondering how um, also could enter this institutionalized spaces in order to open up also, um, yeah. And I'm wondering, or oh, there's a, obviously there's a lot of potential in thinking about um, body politics and bodily practices um, that allow also I would really um, like also to learn more about this and out. Yeah. yeah. Um, I have a question which somehow followed me. The bring it up. Um, it's, and it's such a pity that because I thought perhaps that's the moment to bring it up. Because he was one of, not the only, but perhaps one of the only person in these panels who somehow, let's say, contemporary colleagues in his own discipline who, um, who are somehow appropriating remembrance, uh, uh, tendency, or not tendency, strategies. I ask myself, so if like, for example, right-wing metapolitics has so much to do with artistic strategies, with architectural strategies, with all these things, how can we develop new, new ideas of remembrance Without, um, without understanding how this appropriation of remembrance from the far right people or activists um, somehow this was possible. So I'm not without understanding how this could happen. So I think it's really a pity that uh, Martin Krenn um, went now to the train because uh, we just talked yesterday about the problem that all these kind of movement and like uh, who were developed uh, since many years are right. And so you have to be very clever um, to find new ways to react. And I think one way that I really that we wanted to have Stefan Trübi here because he's kind of um, pointed out in his own discipline very um, well-known artist like Kohlhoff in Berlin building something who has this clearly quotes to some architectures and then what it means in the rebuilding of this kind of waste uh, Berlin uh, city center to do something like that. So you have in the city center still a lot of Nazi, former Nazi ministries who are now again ministries and they do the foreign politics there, they do the, uh, all these politics are in places where people uh, did these things in the 40s already. So it's kind of um, 
it means a lot. And um, the art is not so easy uh, to see because architecture is much, much that it's, yeah, it, you get the job. And like you all might know, uh, also Mies van der Rohe tried to do some buildings for the Hitler. And Corbusier tried to get a job because the fascists didn't like the style. They did something with other uh, people who paid. So it's kind of um, difficult. And like uh, it's, it's a little more maybe not so dependent on the, the big money. And so maybe there's a little little thing left. Hiba, you want to say something or no? <laughs> I thought so. Um, yeah, of course, uh, there's a difference between art and architecture and, uh, um, and what you mentioned is uh, that architecture is, has, has always a function and, um, and, um, um, and someone who pays f for the buildings and, uh, um, and this is a different to art. And, um, ideology but uh, can be a part of ide ideology uh, but I wanted to say something else um, the um, the example with park fiction is a good one because uh, it has made there uh, shows that you can that you can initiate a change uh, I think that was part of the success, um, that, they, uh, that they were not a normal, uh, I don't know the English expre expression, uh, Bürger Initiative um, um, with, with their classical methods, um, so, uh, but, but, they, um, but they have some um, strategies which, uh, which were different and um, for the politics it was difficult to um, yeah, um, to to blockade this, and um, I think that was part of the success, and uh, and it was not it, it was a kind of art movement um, that was connected with the people in San Pauli, and uh, I think that was really an important thing. Um, not to say we we, we do here an art important project, but we 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 ask the people uh, what they want, um, what they can imagine. Um, um, I, I think the main sentence was um, die, die Wünsche verlassen die Wohnung und gehen auf die Straße or something like that. And uh, that was a really good, uh, a, a really a good claim and uh, um, that, that brought together all the people. And uh, I think that could be a way to, to initiate a change with, yeah, with art strategies. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think Park Fiction is also an interesting uh, example in Hamburg because then really well uh, um, uh, popular and so on. But on the same side, there was also the attempt to create the Yaya Diaby circle in remembrance of Yaya Diaby, who was been probably has been killed by um, the, by the police. We don't know this, but because we have no parliamentary. Um, inquiry on police topics in general in Hamburg, so we don't know what police is actually. Yeah, this place or this circuit doesn't exist because just a little street sign is constantly removed. An interesting place where we could also see how like struggles um, manifest directly in the urban space, for example. And um, by this, I would maybe come back to also these uh, these uh, remarks you uh, open up because I think yeah, 
Definitely. So we have always to reflect how we how we create also spaces for our uh, uh, yeah, um, uh, discourse and exchange of ideas and so on. And of course, an event like a, a frontal event where you get a lot of input and you go to Finland and you go to Egypt and you go to Munich and to Austria and then to Berlin and to Austria again. A lot of Austria. I learned a lot of, about Austria definitely in this conference. Um, and... Um, but uh, of course, it's a problem when we have this front and also like this language and also when it's in English, of course. So I thought also maybe I asked some people who are also of my initiative come here, but yeah, they don't speak English. So Uh, the point and it's very important to point it out and I think also out of struggles for example when I look on the uh, anti-racist movement which has been highly influenced and transformed by refugee movement refugee struggles we can see yeah it's amazing when you put up a uh, a couple of days you have a translation of an of a text in 50 language so on so and I think this is the power and this power, definitely, I, as an activist, would love to see more in universe because these people are hanging around here. And occupy this space because I always look on these nice. It's really, it's really funny to occupy this uh, this place here. And um, yeah, I think also when we look on struggles, because there was the question of where, where do struggles took place. And there's one uh, interesting situation we had in the uh, uh, last weeks. So I don't know if you noticed it, but there was this big discussion on Kampnagel and the discussion about Klaus Püschel, this guy who was uh, the perpetrator of the death of Achidion because he's, uh, he uh, organized this Brechmitteleinsätze. He was uh, reading at Kampnagel, and the interesting thing against this, and this was really the point you could be afraid that the left, the radical left, has now took this theater place, which is a theater and a place of the democratic middle where we don't have this extremist stuff is open and doesn't exclude anybody. They have now occupied this place and Amelie Dolfehart is now afraid of all these left people and she has to put, position it against Klaus Püschel and so on. And now we have a struggle. We have a struggle and I mean they come in with this cancer culture shit, but there was no cancer culture. It's open up the discussion. But the point is there's no big left support, also not of the, by the art scene. So I know that there's a lot of shit Kampnagel now has to bear out of the right wing and also out of bourgeois people in Hamburg are super. Uh, Kampnagel doesn't have the support, but I think there is an interesting moment now because um, they trying to transform this place there. And I can just, yeah, invite you on Tuesday, there's that Kampnagel, the uh, commemorance uh, by some uh, BPUC um, activist here out of, uh, out of Hamburg. And also the end of December and 21st of December, there's the, uh, I think, 30, no, 36. Ramazan Avje just here at Espen of Landwehr, so just two events to participate in and there's definitely always the need for more people and also for more creative minds to bring in uh, their ideas. Yeah, I have something very small, just uh, weird to be speaking here in this, these figures here. And I'm not sure if these are nice guys. Who knows are these nice guys somehow? Actually, I would, would have wanted to ask from Stefan, who spoke about, like, because uh, he was speaking about this kind of, yeah, about the, uh, the Nazis, but also the and and somehow like with uh, esoteric ideas, theosophy, 
what are these relations in this room as well. So if somebody knows something about that, I would be very interested in knowing. So actually it's an artist from Hamburg and he's out of the Art Nouveau and uh, there was also Wolfli in that movement and he was a communist and then he went to the Soviet Union uh, after the revolution so it's kind of a, a mixed <laughs> movement and complicated and um, Nora and I talked about that a lot because I that this kind of Hamburg has this tool is built and it's coming out of this um, bringing back the, the hard-working people from the countryside who are doing this bricks, bringing in this bricks in the cities to have this kind of signifying architecture which uh, gives kind of an identity. But uh, the city mostly white because it's so um, and you re re say if I'm wrong, <laughs> he knows more than I, but uh, the city is anyway dark, so the, it's like, like many northern cities, you have like white houses to bring the sun in. Especially context, it was uh, an architect. He's kind of a left guy. And for the art in the house, uh, the head was Abivabur. For sure, maybe it was not so. Might be the best who, from the people who were. There's a whole book in the uh, library about. And um, I'm very. especially this woman on the blue horse and so on. Um, and I had many exams here inside referring, especially to this guy with the, um, with the Regenbogen, um, <laughs> Heiligenschein, I don't know how to say it in English. <laughs> and so it's every time I, when I'm here, I think it's so weird because it's kind of folklore, esoteric, so it was old fashioned by the way it was installed. Everybody knew this because it was after first world war different than by the time this was planned. And there's really a very interesting text from that book available in English, so we can provide this. And as Michaela said, that yeah, this is not the only painting we have from Willy. Some figures outside in the building, they're always um, part of the artistic process here in the school, dealing with that, dealing with the history future to the present and dealing in a contemporary way with that and this is maybe the uh, reactivating that we can do and maybe this is therefore always also interesting to do like uh, conferences as we did in here to always have this uh, looking back and so just it's not that I cannot um, give all the aspects of this um, to this very interesting book and text. And we, I can, Mina, also send it to you on English. And actually, just quickly, because um, we are not enough, uh, we are not far enough with our, with the research questions in, and, and the work in relation to the topic of Jugendstil here in Hamburg. But we just started. And also, this was like a, 
and like our discussions, and this was a reason why we started to look at it. So now, the time, this time was a time when there were programs in Germany where Jews were killed. It was completely normal at that time to say, Jews on the streets and to and it was shocking for Abi Warburg and most probably Abi Warburg more related to the anti-semitism in the mainstream debates about Abi Warburg's work so so far we know already some things In the folk and folkish elements, of course, in in Jugendstil art, learners of the time, of course, much a lot also now is written, but also we find about the racist images and the relation between the folkish art and the colonialism of its time, and we th this is definitely what we are already working on and what the next conference would be about. Now, this is for me a start. The, the Abi Warburg's looking at these things, I'm not sure if this is like, this kind of anti-Semitism is really strong here, but it's strong in the folkish parts of Jugendstil as well. So it's definitely something to work on. So now Heba. Thank you, Nora. I think that's actually really important and, and really interesting to situate ourselves before I express what I wanted to express. Institutions in the United States and Canada that, um, and I'm not sure if I'm fully convinced by this, but it's just something to consider that now anytime a conference or any and they specifically situate themselves statement that's read out, ground on which we're standing, as a kind of um, from what context are we speaking? And I think that kind of leads to hearing kind of the frustrations of here. Art is open for everyone. It's not. This way, this way, this way. And then what art world are we talking about, right? Um, we're here at an art academy. my colleagues, who, all of us who work at art academies, I find them to be actually some of the least creative spaces today. The most irrelevant spaces today, actually. When in fact, it's a huge and complete privilege to be in this kind of space. And why is it? that we, all of us, we professors, students, everyone involved, are not taking that responsibility to actually create those spaces that we want to create. Because there aren't many spaces in which we can expectation to be spoon-fed all the time, whether it's from the top or the bottom. I think these kinds of events to see them as kind of inputs, because I think inputs are, are important. It's important to get these different perspectives. Now, what we do with it is, is what is actually important. And, and how can we nurture those radical spaces? So absolutely, to critique what that format is, to situate with ourselves within that format, and to express how we want it to be different, and to not put that collectively have to do that. And, it's, and it's, it's, a, it's a collective effort. It can't be an expectation of one or the other, simply.
Thank you for reminding me. That, that spoke really uh, straight to my heart because um, of the parallels you made. I was th uh, talking yesterday also to students here and I recalled exactly what you said that in the States they are always like ritualizing this, we are occupying this indigenous land. What should our position in Germany be? And I do think that we lived in um, rented cities actually in which every building is, has been paid by, and um, constructed by the labor and resources from somebody else, right? It's not like I pay a lot of rent, but uh, in a macro level, we should think ourselves as just occupying cities which have been built with the money, resources, and lives from other people, right? bit what Lee said, because I do not agree that uh, just by opening the doors and refugees come to us, that um, really we could change uh, the, um, the power structures which the academy is um, compliant of reproducing in society. And that had happens also in a museum and in a theater. We do have to acknowledge that there are white colonial institutions and then start another discussion. You cannot just open the doors and say, okay, um, the day after tomorrow we will become post-colonial institutions. Because these institutions in the history of, yeah, of a place have been systematically negating the humanity. So, um, yes, uh, it's not just opening the doors, but if we cannot change the colonial finance our own institutions. Yeah. So much. This is such a meaningful uh, conversation, and I'm very happy that we we are coming actually to this point. And uh, Heba, I, I I cannot uh, like your words are much uh, better than I ever could say it. That was uh, for me really really important, because I'm always um, uh, thinking a lot about um, the hundreds of ghosts behind me uh, uh, with my like me and and all the ghosts academies all the ghosts of those who did not those uh, who didn't know that they feel obliged to apply um, so actually of course I also share this dream of let's open up the art academy there are so many resources but in fact, it's exactly as you're saying, so it's uh, all these institutions are super white and therefore as exclusive as possible. But I feel the need to meet again, actually. Uh, strategies how to um, slightly transform uh, uh, like these kind of doors, these exclusive doors. And it's all about how to get into resources, how to, how to gain resources, how to share positions, how to uh, maybe also like develop other formats of gathering, of talking, of listening most of all. And I find it an exclusive subject because it's meant to be for exclusive institutions like art academies. So it's hated uh, in art academies this kind of discussion, and I see the strong need to meet again with uh, uh, hopefully everyone. So maybe we should start a <laughs> we should we should start a conference on that. So and and uh, invite everyone. And I'm I'm really interested in talking about concrete strategies. So, I mean, because maybe we share very similar dreams, but in the end, it's, it's really about how to act, perform in a way. And I think, um, I feel the need to uh, have, a conversa have, have conversations with smart minds about that also. Yeah, thank you. Okay, 
Yeah, I would just agree and would say here's Stuttgart, so it's already and maybe Helsinki places here. And I think like Heba said, I always feel every day when I go in that building, I know how I privileged I am. And uh, to meet people who have the same desire to get something started. And uh, for sure, we have to find some colleagues in the house who have the same desire. Not everybody has the same desire in such an institution. But um, I, I could feel by here are so many things still possible, what is not possible in, in uni university. Um, so I also feel responsible and keep this space and fill it up um, shape in a way because the universities like you might tell us is much more on the, on the neoliberal school are and so we have a lot more which direction we want to go and what support people and so that's really so I feel every time I feel this freedom but on the same hand it's as a uh, um, responsibility and, and a challenge uh, a huge challenge and so yes um, I just wanted to add something to the idea of meeting up continuing the conversation I don't know where to point with the mic. Um, <laughs> I would prefer sitting. Um, so, activist energy combined. Um, and when the meeting happens in an institution, I think there is the, um, the risk of getting lost in the institution. And way of doing it again idea for students between Germany and with, um, trans like uh, really nice idea but the problem was that the program was so full that we actually didn't have the time to speak to each other so I think that's like the it's a good idea, but there's the risk of original idea and then it's ending up with days. They are really interesting and it's a lot of input, but the original idea gets lost. So I think that's the risk and I just wanted to share that experience. Maybe <laughs> the next conference has enough time to speak to each other. Ja, danke Kara, danke Michaela, danke Nora und alle, die da sind. Ich möchte gleich auf Kara eingehen, weil in Englisch, okay. Well. Also, ähm, genau, also ich möchte genau auf dich eingehen und auch auf dich, dessen Name. Es war, ähm, Vielleicht auch tatsächlich aus selbstorganisierten äh, Bewegungen aus der Stadt und sind dann hier und geben diese Impulse. Und ich, ich kann einfach nur sagen, organisiert euch. Also nehmt diesen Input, den ihr bekommt und organisiert. <lacht> Eigentlich möchte ich in dem Moment auch schon Nora das Wort geben, weil es so. Anja... Anja speaks as a professor. She wants to say that um, she, she just says thank you to Kara and Michaela and me. And she wants to say the role of a professor who actually comes from self-organized activism. The only thing that she can say is organize yourself. There, um, there is no way around our role in the institution, no way around 
our need to, whatever we do, with all our activists, the institution, it's done by the institution. And of course, you can claim it to us. I mean, no, no, this is what Anja said. Of course, you can claim it to us. We can work on it together. We can, we play the double fun with it. But beside that, there, there might be a place where you don't have to could be the place you build. Many of us organize ourselves. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I would like um, share my experience at this art school in terms of all to like activate all this potential of students. For example, as um, student parliament, I'm part of the AStA here and I try to get in contact with everyone ab about what's going on and uh, what kind of action we need to change uh, within this system and this in institution and uh, like build a collective that is um, I, also, I would also say we are all organized in some ways. Some people are outside in different collectives. But uh, the question is like, um, connect our different, like, or the different um, knowledges uh, that you have in your double role as professor and activist that we have in our that other people have in their different roles and yeah how how to connect um, because organize yourself makes me angry because we are all organized and we are all now that's so you know you know that we meet every tuesday every tuesday aula warte now already since a year for an open plenary session where everything is addressed that anyone wants to address it's, of course, part of the pedagogical studies, but open for everyone. It's, it's exactly for that. It's deliberately part of an educational logic, so the actual politicization can... ...that is to address, is addressed in the plenary session, and it's a mode of organizing ...one hour from three to four. Missing the We're not having a discussion about whether we're meeting here to talk about what strategies we can think through, particularly through art. As in this moment of crisis, art in many ways seems to be one of the only options. So this kind of defensive attitude of going back and forth is, is counterproductive because we're all here for the same reason. Brainstorm to think together how we can overcome the limitations and very, very strong and clear limitations of the institutions that we work and study in. And they're frustrating for all of us. So I don't think... I think we need to go above and beyond illustrations of, let me rephrase it, we need to hear the critique because what everybody here and particularly the students are saying is incredibly valid. And there's a way in which crisis probably for them might feel different for us and I'm just going to make that separation right now. But ultimately, I think we can't constantly replay that hierarchy, right? 
So we're here, we're sitting in the circle. I think we need to put that conversation to the side and really talk about the meat of why we're here. Because there's a far right demonstration happening outside the door and we need to strategize. <laughs> we're losing that battle. And so there's something urgent at stake. So I think we need to kind of regroup what this conversation really is. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I would uh, want to, yeah, take up this point and pose a question to you. You talked about um, how the institution of university is different than art school. And um, uh, the bigger freedom that art school has. But um, as much as I like the energy, the activist <laughs> energy that was in the. I have to ask back if it's. quite a disturbing ambivalence of the neoliberal paradigm that everyone can apply to university and study there. There is no application process where something like the Bourdieu's habitus or something like that comes into play. So, um, so I, would, I would like to hear your perspective on this ambivalence. Perhaps necessary Mathematics of art and art school and the possibilities of shift and move them. But I, I think we have to consider like the fundamental irony that neoliberalism, the more students um, you, you apply to university, the better it is for university. So there is no, um, no wanting for, for limitation. Um, yeah, so I would like to hear perspective on this irony or paradox? Which field? So I, I don't know if I could address that perfectly because in our university we have a different system to other art. If you with bachelor and master and that a lot of grants that has always uh, to do what we addressed before in the talk, that this is a rich city with very old money, and there uh, is under the surface, from outside broad between grants. So for example, there's a grant in the city of Hamburg, travel, and then you can travel, it comes routes of the big shipping company. There's a lot of money in far away. Also a structure embedded where you can go for at least one year or half a year in a, a partner university. But not every student I could see from my class, and here are some of them, can't do that. I tell them because it's so expensive to do that. Uh, that you can't do it. It's, it's, an, it's an offer that you can do it, but most of the students, I would say, are not able to do it uh, because then you have to just stop for two years' studies and earn money to, to get the opportunity. And so I think the structures we are, uh, what, what you're talking about from outside, are already here for sure, that's clear. And it's also a very hermetic structure who, like Ulf said, who is uh, applying and who feels that he or she could apply and all these things. Um, and I think I, I'm on my own, I can't change that. I only can take the situation and address the, the group with the students I work with to always and be open also for criticism. The structure already that I am paid for the makes the power structure. And 
this is from the structure system, it's already like that. Um, I think if you, then you can also uh, a little bit make it more uh, clear if everybody thinks about it. But on the other hand, it's any, uh, anyway clear any money in the art field, and it's, um, in a way, it's kind of a, um, a paradise of for Geisteswissenschaft, so say, and people who really can find out what they uh, would like to do, and uh, I know. An, a lot of students who came out here who, to who do totally different things, but they found out what they want to do, and they are not so much forced here in a certain system. So I think this is uh, what I like about the place here, yeah? that um, if we speak and listen to each other, maybe to find out in this very important time when you just move out of parents' home and uh, start live on your own and earn your own money to find out what do I want to do? What, where's my, where do I see myself, you know? And uh, I think this is what I see. I could maybe give a hand in that process. And if it would be art at the end, I would be glad if it would be art. But I don't force anyone to do art different way, so there are hundreds of ways of doing art, I would say. Yeah, thank you. Then clear things up. Thanks. Um, I didn't really prepare what I want to say. I just... And... Um, maybe to... Um, kind of uh, make this like movement symposium, um, which is about uh, the manifestation of, um, or like the question, what can, what can, shit. <laughs> so, <laughs> so the manifestation and the narration and um, for me the really underlying baseline question is how uh, social practices which are like moving towards a different or moving towards um, social context which make like different sort of manifestations possible. So as we were talking now about institutionalized space of this art university, okay, what is possible within this framework or how can different frameworks collaborate and interact in order to, um, to shift the um, framework of this institution we are sitting in. Um, yeah, and I also find this idea to um, that we started. Um, but yeah, we still are here to think um, also. <laughs> so. Okay, we try. Um, well, one maybe 
organizatory thing we just thought about. We just thought about, it seems that this discussion is streamed online and I had the um, impression that we are in a deeply open, very critical discussion. So maybe just to underline that else of this institution and so on is uh, watching it. So maybe just to make it clear, because uh, before uh, Hiba uh, mentioned it, I also didn't thought about this. And um, should we say goodbye to our guests, dear guests <laughs> online? It was really nice with you. We had a long, you couldn't speak. We were super frontal to you. Now we are in the middle of a